chapter one of stonehenge a temple restored to the british druids this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. stonehenge a temple restored to the british druids by william stukeley chapter one the wiltshire downs or salisbury plain as commonly called for extent and beauty is without controversy one of the most delightful parts of britain but of late years great encroachments have been made upon it by the plough which threatens the ruin of this fine champagne and of all the monuments of antiquity thereabouts monuments we can scarce say whether more wonderful in themselves more observed or less understood among them stonehenge has been eminent from the remotest ages though tis not the greatest most considerable or most ancient but tis my intent to begin my discourse from it because the latest and from thence proceed upwards in our inquiries about the times and authors of these stupendous works the temples of the druids in our island for i cannot doubt that stonehenge was such the idea we conceive of the distance of time when these kind of works were made cannot be ill-formed if we consider that the utmost accounts of them we have in writing are from the britons the remains of the people who lived here at the time of the roman invasion this is mentioned in some manuscripts of ninius before the saxons and danes came over and the oldest britons speak of this only by tradition far above all memorial they wondered at stonehenge then and were as far to seek about the founders and intent of it as we now they have recourse to magic as is usual when they would account for anything seemingly so much above human power to accomplish they tell us these stones of immense bulk were brought from a plain in the middle of ireland and the like which reports give us only no obscure hint of their true authors the druids who were famed for magic and were driven last into ireland in the time of the romans there they built such like works again or their brethren had built before till christianity to which the greatest and purest part of their own doctrine was akin soon put an end to their polity which the roman arms could not do and they embraced that religion to which their own opinions and rights had so direct a tendency this is the sentiment of origin on ezekiel four and tis sufficiently evident if we consider that the first planters of christianity in ireland immediately converted the whole island without so much as the blood of one martyr nay the druids themselves at that time the only national priests embraced it readily and some of them were very zealous preachers of it and effectual converters of others for instance the great columbanus himself was a druid the apostle of ireland cornwall etc we need not be surprised at this when we assert that there is very much reason to believe these famous philosophic priests came hither as a phoenician colony in the very earliest times even as soon as tyre was founded during the life of the patriarch abraham or very soon after therefore they brought along with them the patriarchal religion 
which was so extremely like christianity that in effect it differed from it only in this they believed in a messiah who was to come into the world as we believe in him that is come further they came from that very country where abraham lived his sons and grandsons a family god almighty had separated from the gross of mankind to stifle the seeds of idolatry a mighty prince and preacher of righteousness and though the memoirs of our druids are extremely short yet we can very evidently discover from them that the druids were of abraham's religion entirely at least in the earliest times and worshipped the supreme being in the same manner as he did and probably according to his example or the example of his and their common ancestors all this i shall prove in the pursuit of this work but before we come to speculation intend to give an exact description of their several temples and the like works for such will be a good foundation for us to build upon that we may proceed from things evident and more known to those less known and which we design to make evident as well as we are able and the nature of it will permit a matter so immersed in the dark mist of time where very few scattered traces remain must needs bespeak the reader's candour the dignity of the subject will excuse my boldness in attempting one so difficult and however i succeed in accounting for these wonderful works at least i shall be instrumental in preserving their memory in giving just drawings of them stonehenge by the extravagant grandeur of the work has attracted the eyes and admiration of all ages after the reformation upon the revival of learning among us the curious began to consider it more intimately i cannot say successfully mr camden rose as the son of antiquity that put out former lights and like caesar affrights all that value a reputation from attempting anything in his way his great skill in roman learning and our english history only enabled him to be as it were silent on stonehenge he saw with excellent judgment that neither roman nor english had place there or could serve to illustrate it he writes modestly as his manner was of these things i am not able so much to give an accurate account as mightily to grieve that the founders of this noble monument cannot be traced out he could not persuade himself that either romans saxons or danes had any hand in it and as for his representation of it in picture i verily believe it was drawn only from fancy or memory or by some engraver from his oral description a d sixteen twenty king james i being at the earl of pembroke's seat at wilton and agreeably surprised with the sight of stonehenge consulted the famous architect inigo jones upon it thinking it a matter in his way this great man who deservedly may be styled the english vitruvius gave his opinion of it as a roman work and left i suppose some few indigested notes in writing thereupon from which his son-in-law john webb composed an entire treatise endeavouring to prove it but they that are acquainted with roman architecture or have considered stonehenge must needs be of a different opinion 
and as my lord bishop of london well observes in his notes on camden it cannot be safe to close with mr jones though his book otherwise be a learned and ingenious piece inigo jones lived thirty years after this and yet mr webb makes an apology for his work that if he had survived to have done it with his own hand it would have been better but tis very reasonably believed that though inigo jones was an extraordinary genius in architecture yet he wanted many qualifications for an author especially in such a work as stonehenge tis my opinion that had his architectonic skill been united to mr camden's learning he could never have demonstrated stonehenge to be a roman work afterwards dr charlton published a piece against webb's performance and certainly has said enough to overthrow it though he could not with equal success establish his own opinion that it was the work of the danes whereas olaus wormius finds no such monuments among the gothic nations which as mr toland observes is answer sufficient to his allegation webb answered the doctor's book and by turns effectually demolished his opinion but could not still vindicate his own yet from all their disputations no spark was struck towards a discovery of the real truth what is the worst part in both performances of mr webb his representation of the real monument in his drawings is fictitious and as mr aubrey rightly observes in endeavouring to retrieve a piece of architecture in vitruvius he abuses the reader with a false representation of the whole it requires no great pains to prove this nor need we take much time to be satisfied in it the work is still extant as soon as a judicious eye comes upon the spot we discern that webb's equilateral triangles forming the cell are fancies his three entrances across the ditch are so too and that he has turned the cell a sixth part from its true situation to favour his imaginary hypothesis but tis against my inclination to find fault with the labours of others nor do i thereby seek to bribe the reader in my own favour i had a great pleasure for several years together in viewing and examining these noble remains of our ancestors what i wrote about them was for my private amusement and that of friends and i published them only for the honour of my country and in hopes that such a publication will not be unserviceable to religion which is my ultimate view though stonehenge be the proudest singularity of this sort in the world as far as we know yet there are so many others manifestly formed upon the same or kindred design by the same measure and for the same purpose all over the britannic isles that we can have no room to doubt of their being made by the same people and that by direction of the british druids there are innumerable from the land's end in cornwall to the utmost northern promontory in scotland where the roman power never reached they are to be found in all the islands between scotland and ireland isle of man all the orkney islands etc and numerous in ireland itself and there is no pretence as far as i can see for any other persons or nations being the founders of them they are circles of stone generally rude of different diameters upon elevated ground barren 
open heaths and downs chiefly made of stones taken from the surface of the ground there are no remembrances of the founders any other than an uninterrupted tradition of their being sacred that there is medicinal virtue in them that they were made by the irish that they were brought from Africa, that they were high places of worship sanctuaries bowing adoring places and what names they commonly have intimate the same thing and in many places the express remembrance and name of druids remain and the people bury their dead in or near them to this day thinking them holy ground mr toland in his history of the druids tells us in gelcos's mount in inishowen in the county of donegal a druidess of that name lived it signifies white-legged according to the ancient manner in homer's time on that hill is her grave and her temple being a sort of diminutive stonehenge which the old irish at this day dare not any way profane many instances of this sort of all these particulars we have in our island particularly the temple on temple downs by Abury. whatever is dug up in or near these works are manifestly remains of the druid times urns bones ornaments of amber glass beads snake stones amulets celts flint hatchets arrowheads and such things as bespeak the rudest ages the utmost antiquity most early plantations of people that came into our island soon after noah's flood i have all the reason in the world to believe them an oriental colony of phoenicians at least that such a one came upon the first celtic plantation of people here which reasons will appear in the progress of this discourse i suppose in matters of such extraordinary antiquity it would be absurd to set about a formal demonstration and those readers would be altogether unreasonable that expect we prove every fact here as they would do by living witnesses before a court of judicature when all is considered that i have put together on this affair a judicious person i presume will agree i have made the matter sufficiently evident and as much as the nature of things requires in the times just preceding the coming of the romans into britain the belgae a most powerful colony from the gallic continent had firmly seated themselves all over the country where stonehenge is situate quite to the southern sea taking in the south part of wiltshire and all dorsetshire wiltshire has its name from the river wylie which in welsh is wylie in latin wagyri from its noise a river of like name in northamptonshire upon the former river at wilton probably lived the carvilius one of the four kings that fought julius caesar the picture of hugh's tumulus we have given towards the end the belgae came into britain upon the south as other celtic nations before had fixed themselves from the east kent the thames etc such as the cantii segontiaci at rabartes etc so that in caesar's time all the south and east parts of britain were dispossessed of their original inhabitants and peopled from the continent and this very work of stonehenge was in the hands of the belgae who built it not in my itinerarium curiosum 
i observe no less than four successive boundary ditches here from the southern shore which with good reason i supposed were made by the belgae as they conquered the country by degrees from the aboriginal inhabitants this shews they must have been a long while about it that the britons disputed every inch of ground with them and that for two reasons as well because of the extraordinary beauty and goodness of the country as fighting pro aris and focius for their great temple of stonehenge not to speak of that other greater temple a little more northward at Abury. the sagontiaci had got hampshire to the east of them before as far as the collinburn river and the atrobates berkshire the first ditch runs between the river of blandford formerly alauna and the river of beer the piddle in dorsetshire two or three miles south of it the second runs to the north of cranbourne chase upon the edge of wiltshire by pentridge it divides the counties of dorset and wiltshire the third is conspicuous upon salisbury plain as we pass from wilton to stonehenge about the two mile stone north of wilton it is drawn between the river avon and the wylie from dornford to newton the fourth is the more famous wansdyke of great extent guahan in old british signifies separatio distinctio guahanu separare and that undoubtedly gave name to the ditch the method of all these ditches is to take the northern edge of a ridge of hills which is always steep the bank is on the south side and in my itinerary i showed a most evident demonstration that it was made before the time of the romans in the passage of the roman road down runway hill wansdyke is the last advanced post of the belgae northwards and that it was made after stonehenge was built is plain because the stones that compose the work were brought from marlborough downs in north wiltshire beyond the dyke and as then in an enemy's country and most probably it was built before the belgae set footing in britain because of the great number of barrows or sepulchral tumuli about it which no doubt were made for the burial of kings and great men the stones of which stonehenge is composed beyond any controversy came from those called the grey weathers upon marlborough downs near Abury, where is that most other wonderful work of this sort which i shall describe in my next volume this is fifteen or sixteen miles off all the greater stones are of that sort except the altar which is of a still harder as designed to resist fire the pyramidals likewise are of a different sort and much harder than the rest like those of that other druid temple called the weddings at stanton drew in somersetshire dr halley was at stonehenge in the year seventeen twenty and brought a piece of it to the royal society i examined it with a microscope tis a composition of crystals of red green and white colours cemented together by nature's art with opaque granules of flinty or stony matter the doctor observed from the general wear of the weather upon the stones that the work must be of an extraordinary antiquity and for aught he knew two or three thousand years old but had the doctor been at Abury, which is made of the same stones 
he might well from the like argumentation conclude that work as old again as stonehenge at least much older and i verily believe it nevertheless the current of so many ages has been more merciful to stonehenge than the insolence of rapacious hands besides the general sackage brought upon the work of old by the unaccountable folly of mankind in breaking pieces off with great hammers this detestable practice arose from the silly notion of the stones being factitious but alas it would be a greater wonder to make them by art than to carry them sixteen miles by art and strength and those people must be inexcusable that deface the monument for so trifling a fancy another argument of vulgar incogitancy is that all the wonder of the work consists in the difficulty of counting the stones and with that the infinite numbers of daily visitants busy themselves this seems to be the remains of superstition and the notion of magic not yet got out of people's heads since druid times but indeed a serious view of this magnificent wonder is apt to put a thinking and judicious person into a kind of ecstasy when he views the struggle between art and nature the grandeur of that art that hides itself and seems unartful for though the contrivance that put this massy frame together must have been exquisite yet the founders endeavoured to hide it by the seeming rudeness of the work the bulk of the constituent parts is so very great that the mortises and tenons must have been prepared to an extreme nicety and like the fabric of solomon's temple every stone tallied and neither axes nor hammers were heard upon the whole structure nevertheless there is not a stone at stonehenge that felt not more or less both axe and hammer of the founders yet tis highly entertaining to consider the judicious carelessness therein really the grand gusto like a great master in drawing secure of the effect a true masterpiece everything proper bold astonishing the lights and shades adapted with inconceivable justness notwithstanding the monstrous size of the work and every part of it tis far from appearing heavy tis composed of several species of work and the proportions of the dissimilar parts recommend the whole and it pleases like a magical spell no one thinks any part of it too great or too little too high or too low and we that can only view it in its ruins the less regret those ruins that if possible add to its solemn majesty the stones of the grey weathers are of a bastard sort of white marble and lie upon the surface of the ground in infinite numbers and of all dimensions they are loose detached from any rock and doubtless lay there ever since the creation being solid parts thrown out to the surface of the fluid globe when its rotation was first impressed all our druid temples are built where these sort of stones from the surface can be had at reasonable distances for they are never taken from quarries here is a very good quarry at chilmark in this country salisbury cathedral and all the great buildings are thence but tis a stone quite different to our work it was a matter of much labour to draw them hither sixteen miles 
my friend the reverend dr stephen hales an excellent author of vegetable statics and other works computed them as follows the stone at the upper end of the cell which is fallen down and broken half is in length says he twenty five feet in breadth seven feet and in thickness at a medium three and a half amounts to six hundred and twelve cubic feet now a cubic foot of headington stone weighs near one hundred and fifty four and a quarter pounds troy if stonehenge stone be of the same specific gravity it will amount to ninety four thousand three hundred and forty eight pounds which is thirty one and a half tons but if this be of the same specific gravity as burford stone which weighs to one hundred and fifty five and three quarters the cubic foot then it will weigh ninety five thousand three hundred and nineteen pounds troy or thirty two tons if it be equal to bladenstone which is one hundred and eighty seven pounds troy per cubic foot then it weighs one hundred and fourteen four hundred and forty four pounds troy or thirty eight tons but i am sure that the stone is of considerably larger dimensions than what dr hales has stated it at and that the sort of stone is much heavier than that of the larger specific gravity he speaks of and that it amounts to more than forty tons and requires more than one hundred and forty oxen to draw it yet this is not the heaviest stone at the place the notion we ought to entertain of stonehenge is not a little enhanced by the discovery i made from frequent mensurations there it gave me the opportunity of finding out the standard and original measure which the people used who made this and all other works of this kind and this precludes any tedious disputation against the opinion of authors for whoever makes any eminent building most certainly forms it upon the common measure in use among the people of that place therefore if the proportions of stonehenge fall into fractions and uncouth numbers when measured by the english french roman or grecian foot we may assuredly conclude the architects were neither english french roman or greeks thus for instance when the accurate greaves tells us the door of the pantheon which is of one stone is of english foot measure nineteen foot and six hundred and two over one thousand within should we not be apt to assert at first sight that the architect in so costly a work did not choose his measures at random but intended that this dimension should be twenty feet when we consider this building is at rome and that it amounts to twenty roman feet must we not conclude it was erected by the roman standard adding to that all the rest of the dimensions of this stately structure fall aptly and judiciously into the same scale so long as any vestigia of st paul's cathedral remain the english foot by which it was built will easily be known i must prepare the reader for a right understanding of our druid edifices by informing him that stonehenge and all other works of this nature in our island are erected by that most ancient measure called a cubit which we read of in the holy scriptures and in ancient profane authors i mean the same individual measure called the hebrew egyptian phoenician cubit most probably derived from noah and adam 
tis the same that's the pyramids of egypt and other their works are projected upon the same as that of moses's tabernacle solomon's temple etc and we may reasonably pride ourselves in possessing these visible monuments of the old measure of the world my predecessor bishop cumberland shows enough to satisfy us that the egyptian and hebrew measure was the same though he has not hit upon that measure to a nicety my friend and colleague dr arbuthnot has been more successful in applying it to such parts of the greater pyramid as evidently establish its proportion to our english foot from the measures greaves has left us and shows it to be twenty inches and four-fifths of english measure thus the doctor observes the side of the greater pyramid at base is six hundred and ninety-three english feet which amounts exactly to four hundred egyptian cubits a full and suitable number for such a square work and without question the originally designed measure the stadium of old i have taken notice that inigo jones observed the like dimensions in laying out the plot of lincoln's in fields the doctor adds many more instances deduced in the same way to confirm it i add that greve says the lowermost steps of the pyramid are near four feet in height which amounts to two cubits and two palms they are three foot in breadth that is one cubit four palms the length of the declining first entrance is ninety-two feet and a half that is fifty-five cubits the length of the next gallery is one hundred and ten feet which amounts to sixty cubits there is another gallery in the pyramid of the same length mr webb says the diameter of stonehenge is one hundred and ten feet this would tempt one to suspect the same measure used in both thus the diameter of the like work at roldrich in oxfordshire described by dr plot is thirty-five yards that is one hundred and ten feet grossly measured father brothace in his observations on upper egypt in our philosophical transactions found a door-case made of one stone in a magnificent building it was twenty-six and a half feet in height this is fifteen cubits dr huntington in the same transactions says he found the sphinx standing by the northern pyramids to be one hundred and ten feet in circuit that is sixty cubits ptolemy in his fourth book and pliny the thirty-six speak of the obelisk raised by king rameses at heliopolis which mr webb gives the length of in english feet one hundred and thirty-six this is eighty cubits that which augustus set up in the circus maximus at rome upon reduction of egypt webb says is one hundred and twenty feet nine inches which amounts to seventy cubits another augustus set up in the campus martius which he says is nine foot higher that is five cubits he speaks again of that erected by fontana before st peter's eighty-one feet which was fifty cubits i suppose the base being injured it was cut a little shorter this at the base he says is nine foot square that is five cubits the vatican obelisk is one hundred and seventy foot high which is one hundred cubits twelve foot broad at bottom which is seven cubits at top 
a third part less hence we gather the measure of the shewbread table of the jews a cubit and a half in height exodus chapter twenty five verse twenty three it had a golden crown about it meaning a moulding or verge or cornice as upon our tea tables peripheria corona because twelve loaves were to be piled upon it it was thirty-one inches in height that of our ordinary eating tables and we shall find by this same cubit divided into its six tofacs or palms all our druid works are performed tis not to be wondered at that it should come into britain with an eastern colony under the conduct of the egyptian tyrian phoenician hercules who was the same person about abraham's time or soon after as i have good reasons to believe which will be shown in its proper place End of chapter 1section two of stonehenge a temple restored to the british druids this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org stonehenge a temple restored to the british druids by william stukeley chapter two come we to the name of stonehenge so called by our saxon ancestors an argument sufficient they were not the builders of it they would have called it by a more honourable name Roadhengen is in Saxon a hanging rod or pole, i.e. a gallows, and Stonehenge is a stone gallows called so from the hanging parts, architraves, or rather imposts, the more remarkable part, and which only can persuade people from thinking the stones grew in the very place as they express it, and so Mr. Camden, Dr. Holland, Mr. Webb, and others think of the wonderful work at Abury, because there are none of these overthwart stones as here. Many are so astonished at the bulk of these stones that, measuring all art and power by their own, they had rather think they sprouted up in their places like mushrooms, at regular distances, in mathematical circles, than that they were placed there by human industry for excellent purpose. But pendulous rocks are now called henges in Yorkshire, and i have been informed of another place there called stonehenge being natural rocks so that i doubt not stonehenge in saxon signifies the hanging stones in cornwall is a heath called now hengston down probably from such a work as ours now demolished it is in the hundred of east and near it is that other memorable antiquity composed of many upright stones called the hurlers a druid temple the old britons or welsh called stonehenge quire gower which some interpret corea gigantum the giant's dance i judge more rightly chorus magnus the great choir round church or temple as bangor where probably was of old another druid temple means the high temple but they mistake it for corea quarae quer a ball dance as necum sings nobilis est lapidum structura corea gigantum as experta suum posse peregit opus mr camden defines the work corone in modum the latin corona a crown corolla a garland and the british crown comes from its circular form as corcorus the armoric britons called crun rotundus crew and the irish corin is the round tip of anything many such like words in all the celtic dialects the chorus of a building among roman christians became appropriate to the more sacred part or east end of churches always turned of a circular form from the time of constantine the great thus all the churches in the holy land thus the chapel in colchester castle and in the tower of london both in my opinion built about his time are round at the east end the old britons or welsh we find had a notion of its being a sacred place though they were not the builders of it for i take them to be the remains of a celtic people that came from a continent who chiefly inhabited england at least the south part when the romans invaded the island they are more particularly the remains of a belgi i suppose their name welsh a corruption of belgi welge in greek belgischen and welschen in german strabo book four speaks of their way of making flannel called lene for which our welsh are so famous 
Strabo gives the Celtic word without the guttural aspirate, clona, in Latin, the most ancient inhabitants, the remains of the old Phoenician colony, and primitive Celts who built Stonehenge were the Picts, Scots, Highland, and Irish, all the same people, though perhaps differing somewhat in dialect, as in situation, no otherwise than a Cumberland man and one of Somersetshire now, the Cornish, I suppose, some remains too of the old Oriental race, but at this very day in Wales they call every antiquated appearance beyond memory Irish. Upon view of land, that from before any one's remembrance appears to have been ploughed, or very ancient ruins of buildings and the like, they immediately pronounce that it was in the times of the Irish. The very same is observable in the north of a Picts or Picht, as they pronounce it gutturally, in the Oriental fashion, which we cannot imitate. They call old foundations, picked houses, etc. Everything is Pictish, whose origin they do not know. These people are conscious that they are not the Aborigines, who by time and successive inundations were forced northward and westward into Scotland and Ireland, and also in the days of the Romans, such of the then inhabitants as would not submit to their Gentile yoke took the same road. The Irish, therefore, or ancient Scottish, is the remnant of the Phoenician language, mixed with old Biscayne and Gaelic, dialects of Celts, and some Oriental Arabic in particular, as Mr. Toland observes. And they are the descendants of the people who built Stonehenge and the like works. Whence spring the strange reports of these stones coming from Egypt, from Africa, from Spain, from Ireland, as retaining some memory of the steps by which the people who preceded their ancestors travelled, nor they themselves, nor even the Belgi, pretending to be the builders of this wonderful work, for the Belgi could not be ignorant of their own coming from the Gallic continent. I have taken notice of another remarkable particular as to the name of Stonehenge, which I apprehend to be of highest antiquity, that it was called the Ambrose or Ambrose, as the famous main ambra by Penzance in Cornwall, another work of the Druids akin to this, and from hence the adjacent town of Ambresbury had its name. But of this matter I must beg the reader's patience till I come to the last chapter and discourse of the antiquity of these works in general. So much at present as to the name of our fabric. It is time to draw towards the sacred pile and fancy ourselves walking upon this delightful plain. Juvat arva videre, non rastris hominum, non uli obnoxia curai. Virgil. Nought can be sweeter than the air that moves o'er this hard and dry, chalky soil. Every step you take upon the smooth carpet, literally, your nose is saluted with the most fragrant smell of serpillum and apium, which, with the short grass, continually cropped by the flocks of sheep, composes the softest and most verdant turf, extremely easy to walk on, and which rises as with a spring under one's feet. The following drawing, tabula three, is a prospect taken from the King's Barrow, west from Vespasian's camp, in the way from Ambresbury to Stonehenge, by the Bristol Road. Though the graver has not done it justice, yet it will give one a general notion of the situation of the place. It is admirably chosen, being in the midst of those wide downs called Salisbury Plain, between the River Avon to the east and a brook that runs into the Willey on the west, these two streams, half round, encompass it at two miles' distance, forming, as it were, a circular area of four or five miles' diameter, composed of gentle acclivities and declivities, open and airy, yet agreeably diversified with the appearance of barrows everywhere upon the edges of the highest grounds, which very barrows are curious and entertaining when viewed at hand, as well for the nicety and handsome turn of their forms as for their great variety, and all within the sight of the temple. These downs feed many flocks of sheep, and no doubt furnish the idea of the Salian and Arcadian plains to the noble Sydney residing at the neighbouring Wilton. The rivers are planted very thick with towns, six miles south of Stonehenge or Salisbury, a mile nearer is Sorbio Dunum, or Old Serum, by the side of which passes the Roman road via Iceniana, reaching from Norfolk into Dorsetshire. As this road goes southward, a mile beyond Woodyates, where it enters Dorsetshire and Cramber and Chase, it passes over a heath where are many old barrows, like these on Salisbury Plain. It happens there to infringe upon one of the barrows, which luckily affords us a demonstration of the road being made since those barrows, of which I took notice in my itinerarium, page 180, 
and further to gratify the curious have here inserted a print of it, tabula four, and may take the opportunity once for all to advertise them of the disadvantage under which all drawings from these planes must appear. They are made for use and instruction, like mathematical figures, and cannot be expected much to please the eye, being formed chiefly from bare lines, admitting no picture-like decoration. I have observed another similar proof of these works being older than the Roman times here, in that Roman road that goes from Marlborough to Bath. It is near Abry, and I have a print of it engraved, which will be exhibited when I next publish an account of that great work. But in the former plate four, I call those druid barrows which are often found on these plains, a circular trench, sometime of one hundred foot diameter, with only a small tump of earth in the middle, under which there is commonly an urn. Sometime two or three of these little tumps or diminutive tumuli within one circle, which it is natural to suppose were friends or relations, these circles are always excellently well marked out. The particular spot of ground where Stonehenge stands is in the lordship of West or Little Ambresbury, the possession of a reverend Mr. Hayward, who at present may be called the Archdruid of the island, "'Tis a delicate part of his large plain, with a gentle declivity from the south-west to the south and north-east, so that the soil which is chalk is perfectly dry and hard, hence the infinite numbers of coaches and horses that through so many centuries have been visiting the place every day have not obliterated the track of the banks and ditches. The water cannot possibly rest anywhere hereabouts. The founders consulted well for the stability of their work and salubrity of the place. Caesar informs us in his commentaries, Bello Gallico, Book 6, Chapter 13, that among the Druids, one has the supreme authority. When he is dead, whoever excels in dignity succeeds. But if there be more candidates, the Archdruid is chose by the votes of the Druids, and sometimes they fight for it. At a certain fixed time of the year the Gaulish Druids meet in the territories of Carnutes, which country is in the middle of Gaul, in a consecrated place. Hither all persons from all quarters come, who have any controversy, and stand to their determination. The discipline of the Druids rose in Britain, and is said from thence to have been brought into Gaul, and now they who design to be more thoroughly initiated therein go over to learn. Here in a few lines the great author acquaints us with a vast fund of ancient history, and upon which whole volumes have been wrote. I observe no more from it at present than that we may very reasonably conclude the elegant and the magnificent structure of Stonehenge was as the metropolitical church of a chief druid of Britain. This was the locus consecratus, where they met at some great festivals in the year, as well to perform the extraordinary sacrifices and religious rites, as to determine causes and civil matters. Caesar calls these appointments of the Druids in Gaul consecrated places, where probably was nothing but a circle of rude stones. Had he seen those of our island, an Abury, or even a Stonehenge, he would scarce have given them the title of temples. He was not used to the old patriarchal way. But I reckon the true reading in that passage quoted from him to be loco consecrato, not luco, which was put in by some bold transcriber who had heard of a fondness of the Druids for groves. But how unfit is a grove for a great and public meeting upon civil affairs? And this for the excellency of its situation upon a vast plain was well calculated for a public meeting of those of the order at an election of a new arch-Druid as caesar's words give light to the work before us so it confirms what the warlike author says of the discipline being originally in britain which the critics upon the continent cannot bear and vainly endeavour to spirit away caesar's meaning the very building of stonehenge to say nothing of other like works here shows it was not in vain that the youth of gaul came to learn of men who could contrive and execute so mighty a work Stonehenge stands not upon the very summit of a hill, but pretty near it, and for more than three-quarters of a circuit you ascend to it very gently from lower ground. At half a mile distance the appearance of it is stately and awful, really august, as you advance nearer, especially up the avenue, which is to the northeast of it, which side is now most perfect. The greatness of its contour fills the eye in an astonishing manner tabula five is the front prospect from the entrance of the avenue the stone that leans o'er the high altar appears through the grand or principal entrance because we stand upon lower ground 
if the reader pleases to cast his eye upon plate 12, there it is represented in orthography, to speak technically, as here in prospect. Hence, by this method of comparing the designs together, we may, without confusion, gather a true notion of the work. Stonehenge is a good deal more in diameter than the outside of St. Paul's cupola, and from a comparison of these two buildings I was able to judge of the vanity of the architect of St. Peter's at Rome, who, in order to degrade the Pantheon, whilst he was imitating it, boasted he would set the Pantheon two hundred foot high in the air, meaning the cupola there. But the architect of the Pantheon, Valerius Ostiensis, had he been alive, would have told him that the vastness of the diameter in these cupolas is lost by the very height. Whatever we would have admired ought to be preserved as the largest dimension. Therefore Valerius, with admirable judgment, has made the outward breadth of the Pantheon one-fifth part completely longer than its height, taken in front. But if we measure it sidewise, taking in the portico, the breadth to the height is more than six to four. By this means the wonder of a Pantheon, the curve or arch, one hundred and fifty Roman feet in diameter, remains. So the curve of Stonehenge, which is above one hundred English feet, appears extraordinary large, and well proportioned upon a height of eighteen foot, which reaches to the top of the outer cornish. That of the inner cornishes is but twenty-four foot high at a medium. For the cornishes of the inner part of Stonehenge, or that which Webb calls the cell, are not all of equal height of which in proper place. Thus both parts of a wonder is preserved, the greatness of a circuit of a whole work, the greatness and height of the parts that compose it, the height being one-fourth of the diameter. The greatness, too, of the lights and shades in Stonehenge, as well as their variety arising from a circular form, gives it all possible advantage, and makes it deserve the appellation of Deorum Gloriosa Domus, as Theocritus and Herodotus generally call temples, and its situation is correspondent to the ancient notion. Bosanius praises the Tanagri in Boeotia for having their temples in clean and distinct areas, distant from profane buildings and traffic. Stonehenge is enclosed within a circular ditch, after one has passed this ditch, says the right reverend annotator to Camden, he ascends thirty-five yards before he comes at the work itself. This measure is the same as that which Webb calls 110 foot, the diameter of the work. For the area enclosed by a ditch wherein Stonehenge is situate is in diameter three times the diameter of Stonehenge. See the plate of the area, 23. Therefore, the distance between the verge of the ditch within side, quite round, to the work of the temple, is equal to the diameter of the temple. The reader remembers what I promised about the scale or measure whereby this work and all others of the Druids is formed, that tis the old Hebrew, Phoenician, or Egyptian cubit, which compared with the English foot amounts to twenty inches and four-fifths. Therefore I have drawn the ensuing comparison and proportion between our English and Hebrew scale, which is to accompany us in the future description. Tabula 6, the scale of cubits and feet compared. That I might not be suspected to favour an hypothesis, I produce other people's measures where I can find them in print, provided they be done with tolerable judgment and accuracy, for both are necessary in our case, with proper allowance. Tis not to be supposed that in this work the minuteness and extreme curiosity of De Godet's, with which he measured the remains of old Rome, is expected or even possible, for though the stones are not chiselled and squared to such preciseness as Roman works are, yet they are chiselled and are far from rude. Nevertheless, everybody has not skill properly to measure them, for they are much impaired by weather, much is knocked off by wretched hands. Those stones that stand are luxated various ways by time and their own weight, by silly people digging about them, and by the unfortunate colony of rabbits lately translated thither, so that we may well say with Claudian, Seram ponderibus pronis tractura ruinam, parscadet assidu flatu, par sempre peresa rumpitur. Abre puet partem vitiosa vetustas. I was forced to make many ad measurements and repeated before I could obtain an exact ground plot, and it required much consideration to do it, and to find out the true scale by which it was composed, the druid cubit, which they brought with them from the east. Therefore, by the annexed scales, tabula six, which I have contrived to answer all lengths, 
the reader will most perfectly understand the subsequent description and see the truth of my assertion and may from thence be enabled to measure any other like works in our islands which i have not had the opportunity of viewing it was the eastern way in laying out a building to use a staff of six cubits long this was of a convenient manageable length and its divisions being half a dozen suited well a reckoning by duodenaries thus in ezekiel book fifty chapter three verse five and apocalypse book twenty one chapter sixteen the angel that laid out the temple of solomon is described as having a reed of six cubits a measuring reed or cane in his hand this being the universal and first measure of antiquity was in time spread all over the world in particular it became the decompedum of the greeks and romans the common measuring standard but tis remarkable they altered the divisions thinking it more artful and convenient to have them in less parts and instead of six cubits they made it consist of ten feet and by time and change the whole measure became somewhat altered from the primitive for the greek decompedum was swelled somewhat too long as the romans diminished theirs a little ezekiel's reed is our ten foot and four inches two-thirds four hundred cubits is the stadium of the ancients or furlong seven hundred feet when you enter the building whether on foot or horseback and cast your eyes around upon the yawning ruins you are struck into an ecstatic reverie which none can describe and they only can be sensible of that feel it other buildings fall by piecemeal but here a single stone is a ruin and lies like the haughty carcass of goliath yet there is as much of it undemolished as enables us sufficiently to recover its form when it was in its most perfect state there is enough of every part to preserve the idea of the whole the next plate tabula seven the peep as i call it into the sanctum sanctorum is drawn at the very entrance and as a view into the inside when we advance further the dark part of a ponderous impost over our heads the chasm of sky between the jams of the cell the odd construction of the whole and the greatness of every part surprises we may well cry out in the poet's words tantum religio potuit if you look upon the perfect part you fancy entire quarries mounted up into the air if upon the rude havoc below you see as it were the bowels of a mountain turned inside outwards it is pleasant likewise to consider the spot upon which tis situate and to take a circular view of the country around it for which purpose i have sketched the following prospects taking in the country almost round the circumference of a horizon this use there will be in them further if ever it happened that this noble work should be destroyed the spot of it may be found by these views tabula eight north prospect from stonehenge tabula nine southwest prospect from stonehenge tabula ten southeast prospect from stonehenge the vallum of the ditch which encloses the area or court is inwards and makes a circular terrace walking upon which we take the foregoing prospects the lowest part of the area is towards the entrance the tops of all the circumjacent hills or rather easy elevations are covered o'er as it were with barrows which cause an agreeable appearance adorning the bare downs with their figures and this ring of barrows reaches no further than till you lose sight of the temple or thereabouts stand at the grand entrance by the stone that lies upon the ground and the view of the temple presents itself as in the fifth plate the front prospect of stonehenge directly down the avenue to the northeast the apex of an hill terminates the horizon between which and the bottom of a valley you see the cursus a work which has never yet been taken notice of being a space of ground included between two long banks going parallel east and west at three hundred fifty foot distance the length ten thousand feet this was designed for the horse races and games like the olympic the isthmian etc of the greeks but we shall speak more particularly of this afterwards in the valley on this side of it the straight part of the avenue terminates in two branches that on the left hand leads to the cursus that on the right goes directly up the hill between two famous groups of barrows each consisting of seven in number 
The farthest, or those northward, I call the oldest king's barrows, the hithermost are vulgarly called the seven king's graves. If we walk a little to the left hand, tabula eight is presented. See the northern long barrow, on this side of which the eye takes in the whole length of the cursus, many barrows at the end and on both sides of it. That marked P was opened by my lord Pembroke, those marked S were opened by myself. What was discovered therein will be treated of hereafter. Further to the west, the highest ground of that spot whereon Stonehenge stands eclipses a distant view, and there are the nearest barrows planted with rabbits which do much damage too at Stonehenge, and threaten no less than the ruin of the whole. Upon the vallum of Stonehenge is one of the stones there, which seems to be a small altar for some kind of libations, and at the letter A, the mark of a cavity, of which more particularly in the next page. The next or southwest prospect, tabula nine, from Stonehenge, takes in the country from Berwick Barn and my Lord Pembroke's wood of Groveley to Salisbury Steeple, a chain of barrows reaching a sixth part of the whole horizon. Many, from the great quantity of these sepulchral tumuli here, injudiciously conclude that there have been great battles upon the plain, and that the slain were buried there. But they are really no other than family burying places set near this temple, for the same reason as we bury in churchyards and consecrated ground. Salisbury steeple, seen from hence, brings to my sorrowful remembrance the great Thomas, Earl of Pembroke, whose noble ashes are there deposited. He was patron of my studies, particularly those relating to Stonehenge. Virtue, piety, magnanimity, learning, generosity, all sublime qualities recommended and added to his illustrious descent. Glorious it will be for me, if these pages live to testify to another age, the intimacy he was pleased to honour me with. Quistalia fando, temperate a lacrimis. In this plate the reader may remark another of the cavities within the vallum, to which that corresponds on the opposite diameter before hinted at. The southeast prospect finishes the circle, tabula ten, looking toward the valley southward, where the rainwater passes from the whole work of Stonehenge, the whole tract of Accursus, and the country beyond it, as far as North Long Barrow, and so is conveyed into the River Avon at Lake. That road between King Barrow and the Seven Barrows is the way to Vespasian's camp, and so to Ambresbury. The barrow under those seven kings of later form is that nearest to Stonehenge. Doubtless in the sacrifices and ceremonies which were here practised, water was used, and I observe most of our Druid temples are set near rivers. The reason why Stonehenge was not set near a river has hitherto effectually preserved it, this part being uninhabitable upon that account, and rather too far off a town for tillage. But when I curiously contemplated the beauty and convenience of this court, I observed two remarkable places, which plainly have a conformity with the two stones set upon the vallum, which stones puzzle all inquirers. These particulars seem to explain one another, and more especially by the help of a coin in Vaillant, tome 2, page 240, for which reason I caused it to be engraven on that plate, tabula 23, the area of Stonehenge. "'Tis a coin of Philip the Roman Emperor, struck by the city of Heliopolis in Coelosyria under Mount Libanus, now called Baldeck, where is an admirable ancient temple remaining, described and pictured in Maundrell's Travels of the Holy Land. In the walls of it are two or three stones of an immense length, which seem to be the fragments of an obelisk, dedicated to the sun, whence the name of Heliopolis. The coin presents a temple built upon a rock, to which they ascend by steps. The temple is enclosed in an area with a wall. On the left hand, by the circuit of the area, is a stone altar. A little further is a great vase for water to be used in the sacrifices. The legend is Colonia Iulia Augusta Felix Heliopolitana. Now the two cavities in the circuit of our area very probably were the places where two great stone vases were set, and the two stones were two altars for some particular rites, which we don't take upon ourselves to explain. See another coin, too, in De Comps Selectiora Numismata, page 23, which is to the same purpose. 
those stones are set in their proper places, in my scheme of the area of Stonehenge, and I leave them to the better conjectures of the learned in these matters. Mr. Webb fancies them the jams of two portals of two entrances besides the great entrance, and makes them favour his imaginary triangles, from which he forms the work of Stonehenge upon a Vitruvian plane, and in order to bring this about he draws one stone, that toward the east, or on the left hand, from the true and only entrance, no less than 120 foot, out of its real place. No doubt the reader will be surprised at this, and the easier credit me when I say his ground plot in other parts is very far from being exact. The reader will observe from my scheme that the two semicircular hollows marked A, A, wherein I suppose the water vases were set, are placed alternatively with the two stones. I don't pretend to show why the Druids did so, but that stone standing together with the upper A and the centre of the grand entrance by the stone that lies flat there make an exact equilateral triangle, yet really have not the least relation to the scheme of the work of Stonehenge in general, or to the cell in particular. Nor do the stones or those hollows point out any other entrance cross the ditch into the area, so in the tabernacle of Moses and temple of Solomon great vases in brass were set for water in the court before the temple. End of chapter 2 Section 3 of Stonehenge, A Temple Restored to the British Druids This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jim Pearson Perry. Stonehenge, A Temple Restored to the British Druids by William Stukeley. Section 3. Let us now set about an examination of the measures of the temple itself. Take a staff ten foot, four inches and three quarters long. Divide it into six equal parts. These are the cubits of the ancients. Each cubit is divided into six parts. These are palms. Thus we have the original measure of the founders of Stonehenge. We will take Mr. Webb's measures and compare them herewith. Mr. Webb says, page 55, that the whole work of Stonehenge, being of a circular form, is 110 foot in diameter. But to be precise, tis 108 and somewhat more, and his own scale in his ground plot shows the same. This is the diameter from outside to outside, which in our ground plot is the principal diameter. The thickness of the stones of the outward circle, he says, page 59, are three foot and a half. Hence the inner diameter becomes almost 102 feet English. If the reader pleases to measure 102 feet upon the comparative scales, which I gave of the English foot and Hebrew cubit, being the measure used by the Druids, or in the scales at the bottom of the ground plot, he will find that it amounts exactly to 60 cubits, 30 cubits being the radius wherewith they struck the circle upon the turf, which is the inner circumference of that work. That sufficiently defined their ground plot, for though they intended in general that the thickness of the stones of this outer circle should be three foot and a half, but to speak more properly, two cubits, which is the same measure, yet they were more careful of one side only of that dimension, and the chief business being with inside this temple, they set the best face of the stones inwards upon that ground line. The other face was suited as well as the scantlings they could get best answered. Webb's three foot and a half is precisely three foot five inches, and somewhat more, making completely two druid cubits, as you find by the scales. They that carefully view Stonehenge will easily see that the stones of the inside both of the outward circle and of the cell, are the smoothest, best wrought, and have the handsomest appearance. For so the polite architects of the eastern part of the world bestowed more elegance within their temples than without, not as our modern London builders, who carve every moulding and crowd every ornament, which they borrow out of books, on the outside of our public structures, that they may more commodiously gather the dust and smoke, the truth is, good sense and observation of nature produces the same ideas in all ages and all nations. Our druids observe that God Almighty, in forming the body of a man, made all the external parts great, bold, round, with ornaments sufficient, 
but where the beauty chiefly consisted in the fitness of the proportions, in symmetry and plainness. In the inside he has displayed all the minutia of divine skill. They have done the like, according to their way, in Stonehenge. So even as to the outward appearance, I find they took care to set those stones that had the best outward face toward the front or entrance. And to embarrass the general scheme of the work, they made use of two centers instead of one, but two cubits distant from one another, perhaps to make the thing intricate and as magical, beside the advantage it gives to the oval form of the included cell. Observe, in laying down the ground plot and projecting this outer circle, we said it was 110 feet, gross measure, in diameter. We remember what is before mentioned, that the learned graves measured two galleries in the greater pyramid, in like manner, each 110 feet. So the Bishop of London says, from the grand entrance of Stonehenge to the work is 35 yards. So he says the diameter of the circle at Roldwich in Oxfordshire is 35 yards all this while sixty druid or egyptian cubits are meant so the length of solomon's temple was sixty cubits whereof the aedes forty cubits the sanctum sanctorum twenty the intention of the founders of stonehenge was this the whole circle was to consist of thirty stones each stone was to be four cubits broad each interval two cubits thirty times four cubits is twice sixty thirty times two cubits is sixty so that thrice sixty cubits completes a circle whose diameter is sixty. A stone being four cubits broad and two cubits thick is double the interval, which is a square of two cubits. Change the places between the stones in their intervals, and it will make a good ground plot for a circular portico of Greek or Roman work. For supposing these intervals to be square plinths of two cubits each side, and columns properly set upon them, it will admit of three diameters for the intercolumniation, which is the diastyle manner in architecture. But to talk of pinkness style with Mr. Webb and call these stones of ours pillars or pilasters, where they are twice as broad as the space between them, and to call this an order is monstrous. Thus a stone and an interval in this outward circle of Stonehenge makes three squares, two allotted to the stone, one to the interval which for stability and beauty withal, in such a work as ours, is a good proportion. The curiosity of the work and the general orthography of the outward circle I have designed in plate 12, and it may be seen in these seven stones now remaining at the grand entrance, which show what strictly was the intent of the founders and where they took the liberty to relax of that strictness, and that with judgment, so as to produce a good effect. I shall explain it from Mr. Webb's own measures that I may give the truth its full advantage. Page 59. He says the stones which made the outer circles are seven foot in breadth. Observe that seven foot makes four cubits of the druids. He says they are fifteen foot and a half high. You find that exactly nine cubits, page 61, he says, the architraves lying round upon them are two foot and a half high, that is, our cubit and a half. He mentions their breadth to be three foot and a half, equal to the thickness of the upright, that is, our two cubits. They are joined in the middle of each perpendicular stone. Hence, though he has not mentioned the length of these architraves, we gather them to be six cubits long. This is spoke of their inward length, for outwardly they must needs be somewhat longer, as being an arc of a larger circle. I must observe about these architraves, as Mr. Webb calls them, that they are more properly called imposts or cornishes, for they are not made to support anything above them, as is the nature of an architrave, but for the stability and ornament of what supports them, which is the nature of imposts and cornishes. Though these bodies of stone here never had, or were intended to have, any mouldings upon them, like Greek and Roman works, they are wrought perfectly plain and suitable to the stones that support them. I observe further, the chiseling of our upright stones is only above ground, for the four or five foot in length below ground is left in the original natural form, and that the upright stones are made very judiciously to diminish a little every way, so that at top they are but three cubits and a half broad, and so much narrower as to suffer their impost to hang over a little, or project, in proper terms, over the heads of the uprights, both with inside and without. 
By this means the uprights are in much less danger of falling or swerving anyway, and the imposts, which are not broader than the thickness of the stones at the bottom, which support them, have a graceful effect, by projecting a little without danger of surcharging them. We see here plain, natural, easy geometry, what we may call the first rudiment of art, deduced from common reason, but they that can find any Roman delicacy herein must, I freely own, have a much nicer eye and taste than I can pretend to. The Druids had, from patriarchal times, made their altars or temples of rude, unpolished stones, but now hearing, probably from Phoenician traders, of the glories of Solomon's temple, or at least of other temples made artfully in imitation of it, such as those of Sesostris in Egypt and others about Phoenicia, they thus made a small approach to square scantlings and stones wrought. And this seems to have been the first and last work of theirs of this kind that I can hear of, either in the Britannic Isles or on the continent. At no doubt, but it must give them so high a reputation that even the people of Gaul themselves could not help owning to Caesar that the discipline of these men was first begun here and carried on with such success that they sent their youth from the continent hither as to an academy to be initiated in their learning. We are not to suppose these words are to be strictly taken, as if the Druids here began their institution, but that being an oriental manner of religion and much different from that on the Gallic continent, what they had of it there was derived from Britain. It appeared as much new to them, who were chiefly idolaters, as in many ages preceding. Abraham's religion appeared new to the inhabitants of Phoenicia and Egypt, who were then not much tinctured with idolatry. Nor, probably, had the Druids much opportunity of building another such work as Stonehenge between its foundation and the Roman times. Because I apprehend the encroachments of the Gallic nations from the continent, seating themselves in Britain about two hundred years before Caesar's invasion, had molested the Druids much in these southern counties, and drove them with the old Britons farther northward and westward. But of this we will treat more particularly afterwards when we offer our opinion of the time when it was made. In the orthographic plate, tab 12, we may see the strict geometry of the work of this outward circle, and the artful variation therefrom, in order to make the aperture of the grand entrance somewhat wider than the rest. Mr. Webb does not take notice of this particular, and he might have triumphed in it, for it is no less than the Vitruvian rule to relax the intercolumniation just in the middle of the portico, in the front of a temple, and over against the door. He speaks of it in Lieb 3.2, when talking of the eustyle ratio, the best for use, appearance, and strength. He directs the intercolumniation to be of two diameters and one quarter, but the middle intercolumniation of three diameters, by which means the approach to the door will be much more commodious and nothing diminished of beauty in aspect. And this is the reality of the case before us. But, alas, our British priests knew nothing of Vitruvius. They deduced this knack from an authority much ancienter than him, viz., from pure natural reason and good sense. Nor does this hurt the whole of the work. The aperture ought strictly to have been two cubits equal to the rest, but they advanced it to two cubits and a half. This only crowds the next intervals on each side a small matter nearer, the rest preserving their true distance quite round. And in the work itself, tis obvious enough to the naked eye. Again, there is another remarkable particular observed by our priests because the aperture of the principal entrance we are speaking of is wider than the rest, they have made the impost over it thicker than the rest, and tis equally obvious to the naked eye. This was the more effectually to secure it from breaking, but this additional thickness they have put below. They were sensible it would have produced an ill effect at top by breaking the line of that noble cincture. It must be owned this was extremely well adjusted and the breadth of the stone that hangs overhead in this place is astonishing. See plate 7, called A Peep into the Sanctum Sanctorum. I had the greatest pleasure imaginable in the year 1723 July in being here for several days together with the learned Heneage Lord Winchelsea. I have just reason to boast of that intimacy he indulged me in, and his memory must forever be dear to me for his noble qualities. My lord and I were very careful in taking the measures of Stonehenge, 
and with great grief we observed the stones here represented in that plate and tab five the front view to be much deviated forward from their true perpendicular and in the utmost danger of falling tis to be feared some indiscreet people have been digging about the great entrance with ridiculous hopes of finding treasure and loosened thereby the chalky foundation we found by measure that the upper edge of the impost overhangs no less than two foot seven inches which is very considerable in a height of eighteen the whole breadth at the foundation is but three foot and a half and this noble front is now chiefly kept up by the masonry of the mortise and tendon of the impost through the middle of the principal entrance runs the principal line of the whole work the diameter from northeast to southwest this line cuts the middle of the altar length of the cell the entrance the entrance into the court and so runs down the middle of the avenue to the bottom of the valley for almost two thousand feet together this is very apparent to any one at first sight and determines this for the only principal entrance of the temple all the other intervals of the stone of the outer circle have no preeminence in any respect there is no such thing as three entrances which mr webb's scheme suggests he might as well have pretended there are six for so many points of his triangles meet in intervals at the verge of the outer circle upon this line are all the principal centers that compose the work it varies a small matter from true northeast the contrivance of our artificers in making mortises and tendons between the upright stones and the imposts is admirable but so contrary to any practice of the romans that it alone is enough to disqualify their claim to the work much judgment and good sense is shewn in the management of them the centers of the tenons are two cubits distant from each other upon each upright by this means there is four cubits distance from the center of the tenon of one stone to the center of the tenon of its next neighbor across the intervals or in one impost divide the upper face of an upright into its two squares the center of a tenon is in the center of that square divide the under face of an impost into its three squares the correspondent mortices are in the centers of the two outermost squares and this was the strict geometrical method used by the founders so that the stones fitted as soon as placed in their true situations these tenons and mortices of this outer circle are round and fit one another very aptly the tenons and mortices are ten inches and a half in diameter which is three palms or half a cubit they rather resemble half an egg than a hemisphere these most effectually keep both uprights and imposts from luxation and they must have used great labor that threw them down sir robert sibbard speaks of a rocking stone in ireland contrived with mortise and tendon like ours of which mr tolan gives us an account with others like the works of the druids the whole height of upright and impost is ten cubits and a half the uprights nine cubits the impost one cubit and a half so that the impost is a sixth part of the height of the upright if we measure on the outside the collective breadth of two upright stones and the interval between them tis ten cubits and a half equal to the whole height and the interval is half the breadth of a stone the thickness of a stone is half its breadth that impost which lies over the grand entrance we said was deeper and longer than the rest abraham sturges an architect and myself measured it in the presence of lord winchelsea its middle length is eleven feet ten inches which is six cubits four palms two foot eleven inches high which is one cubit four palms they have likewise added a little to its breadth more than the rest being three foot nine inches which is two cubits and a palm n b the scale of my drawing is adapted for the inside of the circle upon which the proportions and geometry are built so that the outward nineteen breadths of the uprights and lengths of the imposts are somewhat more than by the scale appears here the intelligent reader knows this must be the consequence in arcs of a larger circle nothing in nature could be of a more simple idea than this vast circle of stones and its crown work or corona at top and yet its effect is truly majestic and venerable which is the main requisite in sacred structures a single stone is a thing worthy of admiration but the boldness and great relievio of the whole compages can only be rightly apprehended from view of the original on the outside the imposts are rounded a little to humour the curvity of the circle and within they are straight though they ought to be a little curved this makes them somewhat broader in the middle than at the end and broader than the two cubits 
which is the thickness of the upright stones upon an ichnography, so that within the crown work makes a polygon of thirty sides. But this little artifice, without debasing the beauty of the work in the least, adds much strength to the whole and to the impost in particular. We may guess their proportions are well chose when so many of them are thrown down by violence and not broke in the fall, and their greater breadth in the middle, or that part that covers the intervals, adds to the solemnity of the place by the shadow they present at the bottom. The whole affair of jointing in this building is very curious and seems to be the oldest and only specimen of this kind of work in the world. There is nothing that I know of comes in competition with it but the celebrated ruins at Persepolis. It is composed of great stones laid across one another, as Stonehenge, but not with mortise and tenon. The vulgar and learned, too, generally take it for the remains of the palace of the Persian monarchs, burnt by Alexander the Great, but it is really an open temple like ours, and made much in the same manner. But the stones are well squared, ornamented with mouldings and carvings, and the whole of them are squares, not round works as here. Persepolis is a mixture between the ancient patriarchal round form of open temples and the square form introduced under the Jewish dispensation in opposition to the former, which were generally degenerated into idolatrous purposes. But of this I shall speak more perhaps hereafter when I treat of the most ancient temples. Of the outer circle at Stonehenge, which in its perfection consisted of sixty stones, thirty uprights, and thirty imposts, there are more than half the uprights, viz. seventeen left standing. Eleven of these uprights remained continuous by the grand entrance, five imposts upon them. One upright at the back of the temple, or on the southwest, leans upon a stone of the inner circle. There are six more lying upon the ground, whole or in pieces so that twenty-four out of thirty are still visible at the place. There is but one impost more in its proper place, and but two lying upon the ground, so that twenty-two are carried off. Hence, I infer this temple was not defaced when Christianity prevailed, but some rude and sacrilegious hands carried the stones away for other uses. However, it cannot but be the highest pleasure imaginable to a regular mind to walk round and contemplate the stately ruins which I have endeavored to preserve in the outside views, such as from the southwest, and so of the rest. But we may say with Lucum, Gem magis atque magis praecaps agit omnia fatum. End of section 3《ハッピーストーンヘンジ・アテンプル・レストーン・トゥ・ブリティッシュ・ドゥイッズ》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stonehenge, a Temple Restored to the British Druids by William Stukeley, Chapter 4. Many drawings have been made and published of Stonehenge, but they are not done in a scientific way so as may prove any point or improve our understanding in the work. I have therefore drawn four architectonic orthographies. One, tabula twelve, is of the front and outside. Three are different sections upon the two principal diameters of a work. These will forever preserve a memory of the thing when the ruins, even of these ruins, are perished, because from them and the ground plot at any time an exact model may be made. Tabulae fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. These orthographies show the primary intent of the founders. They are the designs which the Druids made before they put the work in execution. And by comparing them with the drawings correspondent of the ruins, we gain a just idea of the place when it was in its perfection. But now, as we are going to enter into the building, it will be proper again to survey the ground plot, Tabula 11, which is so different from that published by Mr. Webb. Instead of an imaginary hexagon, we see a most noble and beautiful ellipsis which composes the cell as he names it. I think adatum a proper word. There is nothing like it to my knowledge in all antiquity, and tis an original invention of our druids, an ingenious contrivance to relax the inner and more sacred part where they perform their religious offices. The two outward circles do not hinder the sight, but add much to the solemnity of the place and the duties, by the crebrity and variety of their intervals. They that were within, when it was in perfection, would see a most notable effect produced by this elliptical figure, included in a circular corona, having a large hemisphere of the heavens for its covering. 
Somewhat more than eight feet inward from the inside of this exterior circle is another circle of much lesser stones in the measure of a druid's tis five cubits. This circle was made by a radius of twenty-four cubits drawn from the common centres of the work. This struck in the chalk the line of a circumference wherein they set these stones. The stones that compose it are forty in number, forming with the outward circle, as it were, a circular portico a most beautiful walk and of a pretty effect somewhat of a beauty of it may be seen in plate seventeen where at present tis most perfect we are imposed on in mr webb's scheme where he places only thirty stones equal to the number of the outer circle the better to humour his fancy of the dipteric aspect page seventy six he is for persuading us that this is a roman work composed from a mixture of the plainness and solidness of a tuscan order with the delicacy of a corinthian that in aspect tis dipteros hypathros, that in manner tis pycnostylus, which, when applied to our antiquity, is no better than playing with words. For suppose this inner circle consisted of only thirty stones, and they set, as in his scheme, upon the same radius as those of the outer. What conformity has this to a portico properly, to an order Tuscan, Corinthian, or any other? What similitude is there between these stones and a column? where one sort is square oblong the other opposite by his own account pyramidal of what order is a column or rather a pilaster where its height is little more than twice its diameter where is the base the shaft the capital or anything that belongs to a pillar pilaster or portico the truth and fact is this the inner circle has forty stones in it whence few or none but those two intervals upon the principal diameter happen precisely to correspond with those of the outer circle whereby a much better effect is produced than if the case had been as webb would have it for a regularity there would have been trifling and impertinent again mr webb makes these stones pyramidal in shape without reason they are truly flat parallelograms as those of the outer circle he says page fifty nine they are one foot and a half in breadth but they are twice as much their general and design proportion is two cubits or two cubits and a half as they happen to find suitable stones a radius of twenty-three cubits strikes the inner circumference of twenty-four the outer they are as we said before a cubit thick and four cubits and a half in height which is above seven foot this was their stated proportion being every way the half of the outer uprights such seems to have been the original purpose of the founders though tis not very precise neither in design nor execution in some places the stones are broader than the intervals in some otherwise so that in the ground plot i chose to mark them as equal each two cubits and a half there are scarce any of these entire as to all these dimensions but from all and from the symmetry of these celtic kind of works which i have been conversant in i found this to be the intention of the authors tis easy for any one to satisfy themselves they never were pyramidal for behind the upper end of the adytum there are three or four left much broader than thick above twice and not the least semblance of a pyramid i doubt not but he means an obelisk to which they might some of them possibly be likened but not at all to a pyramid nor indeed do i imagine anything of an obelisk was in the founder's view but the stones diminish a little upward as common reason dictates they ought to do nor need we bestow the pompous words of either pyramid or obelisk upon them for they cannot be said to imitate either one or other in shape use much less magnitude the chief thing to be regarded in a comparison of this sort the central distance between these stones of the inner circle measured upon their outward circumference is four cubits i observe further that the two stones of the principal entrance of this circle correspondent to that of the outer circle are broader and taller and set at a greater distance from each other being rather more than that of the principal entrance in the outer circle it is evident too that they are set somewhat more inward than the rest so as that their outward face stands on the line that marks the inner circumference of the inner circle i know no reason for all this unless it be that the outside of these two stones is the outside of the hither end of the ellipsis of the adytum for so it corresponds by measure upon the ground plot this is apparent that they eminently point out the principal entrance of that circle which is also the entrance into the adytum for five stones on this hand and five on that are as it were the cancelli between the sanctum and sanctum sanctorum 
if we may use such expressions. "'Tis scarce worth mentioning to the reader that there never were any imposts over the heads of these stones of the inner circle. They are sufficiently fastened into the ground. Such would have been no security to them, no ornament. They are of a harder kind of stone than the rest, as they are lesser, the better to resist violence. There are but nineteen of a whole number left, but eleven of them are standing in situ. There are five in one place standing contiguous, three in another, two in another. The walk between these two circles, which is three hundred foot in circumference, is very noble and very delightful. Probably it gave Inigo Jones the idea of designing that fine circular portico, which is one great beauty among many in his drawings for Whitehall, published lately from the originals by my Lord Burlington, who has a true notion of the extraordinary merit of that great man, and very commendably has revived his memory. Such a circular portico, put in execution, would have a marvellous effect, much exceed a common gallery in use, because tis a perpetual walk, without turning back, and well becomes a royal residence. The best view of this sort, to be had from our work, is from the north, as in Tabula 17. The reader cannot but observe how little pretense here is for an imitation of Greek or Roman porticos, notwithstanding the grand and agreeable curve of the outward circle. But when we see the disproportion of the inner circle in regard to any purpose of this sort, we must own the invention of Hermogenes in contriving the pseudo-dipteros is here applied with an ill grace. The founders of Stonehenge could have no need of makeshifts for want of room on Salisbury Plain, or how could a concentric row of little stones, or pillars, if he will so have it, bear any resemblance to the contrivance of Hermogenes, which consisted in having none, in taking away the whole inner row of pillars, so as to add to the convenience of room, and preserve the aspect at the same time? Most undoubtedly the Druids had no further meaning in it than to make use of the even number of thirty greater stones and forty lesser stones, and this was to produce a more perplexed variety by the interstices having no regard to one another. So far were they from having a notion of Grecian beauty in the pillars of circular porticos being set on the same radius, pillar answering to pillar, intercolumnation to intercolumnation, and this will be shown repeatedly in the progress of this work to be the common practice of the Druids in other like instances. But when we consider the cell, as Mr. Webb names it, we find him guilty of great disingenuity in ill-conceiving the form of it, and in distorting his ground-plots to colour it over the better. The minute you enter this adytum, as in tabula 18, you discover tis not a hexagon, nor ever was intended for one, and there can be no greater absurdity than to imagine it one. It is in truth composed of certain compages of stone, which I shall call trilithons, because made each of two upright stones with an impost at top, and there are manifestly five of these trilithons remaining. But the naked eye easily discovers they are very far from making five sides of a hexagon. They cannot be brought to any approach of a truly circular polygon. Three trilithons of the five are remaining entire. Two are ruined indeed in some measure, but the stones remain in situ, and nothing is easier than to take the ground plot from symmetry and correspondency. We see the two trilithons on the wings or sides of the adytum are set almost in a straight line, one of another, when in a hexagon form they ought to make a considerable angle. If you examine them trigonometrically, the true angle of an hexagon is 120 degrees, but here is an angle of near 150, and by making it an hexagon he supposes one trilithon entirely gone, that nearest the grand entrance, when there is not the least appearance that ever there were such stones there. No cavity in the earth, no stump or fragment visible, nor is it easy to imagine how three stones of so vast a bulk could have been clean carried away, either whole or in pieces. There is no room for them to have been carried away whole, no traces of their having been thrown down, broken pieces, and so carried away, this outer side of the work being the most perfect of the whole. Of the ruins of the other trilithons there is not the least part wanting. What has been thrown down and broke remains upon the spot. But this trilithon in dispute must needs have been spirited away by nothing less than Merlin's magic which erected it as the monk's fable. Besides, if it were still standing, it would be very far from making this adytum a regular hexagon, to which he has accommodated his peripteros scheme, page 87. 
Further, granting it was a regular hexagon, it would be very far from corresponding with that scheme or have the least appearance of its being taken from such a one, for our editor there has converted the cell quite from the nature of that at Stonehenge. He has made the upper end of his cell at the letter H, opposite to the grand entrance G, not a trilithon, as it is notoriously at Stonehenge, but an angular interval between two trilithons. It is not the side of a figure, but the angle whereas it is most notorious at Stonehenge that the upper end of the adytum opposite to the grand entrance and to the whole length of the avenue and entrance between it and the area is a trilithon, not an angle or interval, and that trilithon is exceeding stately, though in ruins, one of the uprights being fallen, the other leaning, so that here we have the cell converted full a sixth part of a whole compass from its true and original situation, and so in all the schemes of Mr. Webb's book, not one excepted. In that, for instance, scheme one, page 56, the high altar is placed at D, not against a trilithon as it ought to be, opposite to the grand entrance in the front of the temple, and to the only entrance below into the area, but against an angle between two. If, then, you suppose that hexagon removed back a sixth part, so as that a trilithon be set behind the high altar, as it is really in the thing itself, and upon the principal diameter of the whole work, then this absurd consequence follows, that the opposite trilithon of the cell stands in the very midst of the entrance into the cell upon the same principal ground line or diameter of the work, and quite obstructs the view and entrance into it. It is altogether as ridiculous as if a dead wall was built under St. Paul's organ loft, which is and ought to be the chief entrance into the choir. Besides, by Webb's ground plots and uprights, it seems as if, when you entered this adytum, there were three trilithons on the right and three on the left, whereas it is most obvious there are but two on the right and two on the left. When you advance into it, the orderly way, from the northeast grand entrance of the avenue, which he himself, page 55, owns to be the principal. But I am tired of so ungrateful a talk, which necessity alone could have extorted from me. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Stonehenge A Temple Restored to the British Druids This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Ronald G. Bars Stonehenge, A Temple Restored to the British Druids by William Stuckley Chapter 5 Of the Cell or Didum of Stonehenge Of the Surgeon's Amphitheatre, London Disputations become cloisters and porticos. Let us now, with minds free from passion, enter the adidum with an intent to find out its true figure to examine what it really was and what it is, and that may easily be done because, as I said before, as to the trilithons of which it is chiefly composed, they are all remaining. Not a bit is lost, but what mischievous and silly people knock off with hammers to see whether, as the wretched vulgar notion would have it, the stones be factitious. Table 18 is a design of it, which I made sitting in the center of the grand entrance, in the inner circle. This point is properly the doorway or entrance into the adidum, as a wicket or little door, whilst the jams of the hittermost trilithons present themselves. As the greater door, or above 40 feet wide, 25 cubits, I observe in the old Greek story many footsteps of the primitive patriarchal way left in their sacred structures, which are parallels to this work before us, and others of our Druids. For instance, Posenius in Atticus speaks of a temple dedicated to Venus, in the front of which is a wall, as he calls it, built of rude stones. Nevertheless, he concludes it to be a very famous work, 
One may very well imagine this wall of rude stones is the remnant of some such old work as ours, left for the sacred regard the people had to it. Even after art was risen to great height, together with superstition and idolatry, for that the most ancient Greeks had very little of idolatry, any more than our Druids, I shall show when I discourse on that head. Again, the more sacred part of the temple at Heropolis, answering to our adidum, had no door, though. None entered therein but the chief priests. Lucian de De Syria, I suppose it was in imitation of the ancient usage, without doors to shut or open, as our temple here. For the ancients thought it wrong to confine the deity within any covered place, till Moses, by God's direction, made a tabernacle covered with skins, which was to adumbrate the Messiah Son of God, who was to be clothed without nature, and Solomon's temple was built in imitation of this tabernacle. But before that the ancients meant no more by temples or altars, as they were first called, than a certain known and conspicuous place, ornamented in a particular manner, that should mark out a kebla, or a place towards which you are to address the deity, and that for uniformity's sake. As the Turks and Arabians do now, who are the descendants of Ishmael, and had this custom from Abraham, though the Supreme Being be omnipresent, yet for our convenience, where time, place, and such kind of circumstances are necessary to a public action, he would have, as it were, the place of his presence made notorious as in the Jewish dispensation he did in a most extraordinary manner by the Shekinah, and from Solomon's temple. All the rest of the world borrowed the fashion of temples, properly so called, built magnificently and with roofs, for the sacred houses mentioned in scripture before then were only little chapels, shrines, like our druids kissed vans, which sometime they carried about in a cart, sometime were fixed in cities for public use, as the Beth Dagon and the like. These were but kiss vans improved, niches turned into sakella, in imitation of two or three stones in Abraham's altar, which we may well call the Kebla, and find many of them among our Druid antiquities. The cell is formed by a radius of 12 cubits and a half. From the two centers, A and B, as to the inward curve, the outward takes a radius of 15 cubits. For these stones are two cubits and a half thick. The two circles are turned into an oval by a radius of 30 cubits, after the usual manner. Set in the two centers, C and D, where the two circles intersect. The former centers are 12 cubits and a half distant from each other, the length of the radius. The same oval is obtained by a string of 60 cubits. The ends tied together and turned around upon two centers, according to the gardener's method. An oval formed as this is upon two centers coinciding with each other's circumference, or which is the same thing whose centers are distant from each other, the length of their radius. It is most natural and most beautiful, being the shape of an egg. Most probably, these religious philosophers had a meaning in thus including an egg-like figure within a circle, more than mere affectation of variety. Whatever that was, we may reasonably conclude that from the method in antiquity, of making the Kebla of a curved figure, the Christians borrowed theirs of turning the east end of their churches in that manner, and that the Druids in the work before us have produced the noblest Kistvayan or Kebla that is known. 
My purpose in drawing many prick lines upon the plate is not difficult to be understood, nor does it require particular explanations. To avoid affectation or tediousness, I leave them to the reader's amusement. Only observe that Mr. Webb's equilateral triangles have no hand in forming the cell. The intent of it is very distant from a regular polygon, but that it is incomparably more beautiful than such a one would have rendered it. It is as a magnificent niche, 27 cubits long, and as much broad, measuring in the widest place. This part is called encos, or concha temple, or a didim, into which we may suppose none but the upper order of priests, together with the high priest, were commonly to enter during the time of ministration in religious rites. We may imagine the beauty of the appearance here upon those occasions when an innumerable company of druids assisted all in white surplices the center of the eccentricity of this oval is but three cubits nearer the entrance than the center of the whole work and they have cut off but one trilithon which they make the opening of the adidum meeting the eye to great advantage from the grand entrance by the aforesaid contrivance there is left a space of five cubits between the jams of the opening of the adidum and the inner circle in front just the same as is between the inner and outer circle the inner circle there performing the office of hanselli to it as we observed before if a choir of this form was put in practice and executed by a masterly hand, it would have a very extraordinary effect and perhaps excel the too similar concave of a cupola. Our druids had undoubtedly such a notion in placing this within a circle, and for the sake of this, they turned the two circles into a smaller species of an ellipsis. There's a druid antiquity like our adidum in shape called Egwin's Lamanog on the top of Arnig Var in Lankill Parish, Marionshire, but made of a continued wall. The ancients thought the world of an egg-like shape, as the world is the temple of the deity. They judged it proper to form their temples so as to have a resemblance thereto. The ancient hieroglyphic of the deity is a circle and i have reason to believe it more ancient than the flood plato who learnt much from the ancestors of our druids says in diogenes laertius that god is spherical which he must mean hieroglyphically so our druids as well as he may mean the infinity of nature in the deity who made the world by this scheme of stonehenge at least they understood by the circle the seat and residence of the deity the heavens which include all things it seems to me that inigo jones from this adidum projected the plan of the surgeon's theatre in london a fabric for seeing and hearing much admired by all good judges, and which my Lord Burlington, out of a spirit truly noble and a great love for the architect's memory, has lately repaired with his own charges and excellent skill. I find the surgeon's theatre, or rather amphitheatre, is formed from the same proportion as our adidum, the transverse and conjugate diameters being as 4 to 3, viz. 40 foot and 30 foot. And this appears to me a strong presumption that Inigo Jones did not make the ground plot of Stonehenge published under his name. The surgeon's amphitheater is a good deal less than our cell. Such is the noble and easy geometry of the adidum of Stonehenge. The stones that compose it are really stupendous. Their height, breadth, and thickness are enormous. 
and to see so many of them placed together in a nice and critical figure with exactness to consider as it were not a pillar of one stone but a whole wall a side an end of a temple of one stone to view them curiously creates such emotion in the mind which words can't express one very remarkable particular in the construction of this adidum has escaped all observers which is this as this part is composed of trilithons as i before called them set two and two on each side and one right before they rise in height and beauty of the stones from the lower end of the adidum to the upper end my meaning is this the two hithermost trilithons corresponding for those next the grand entrance on the right hand and on the left are exceeded in height by the two next in order and those are exceeded by the trilithon behind the altar in the upper end of this choir so that in laying down the measures of the parts that compose this place the reader must be content to take my word. Mr. Webb's measures cannot be precise in all of them, seeing he knew nothing of this particular, and that his notion of an hexagon is contradicted by it, as well as by fact. He says, page 60, The stones of the greater hexagon seven foot and a half in breadth, three foot nine inches thick and twenty foot high each stone having one tenon in the middle his measure of seven foot and a half in breadth only shows the vastness of the stones it is no precise measure for the founders regarded not any preciseness in their breadth because two together were designed to make a compagus whereon to set the impost and this i call a trilithon each trilithon stands by itself independent of its neighbor not as the stones and imposts of the outer circle linked together in a common corona by the imposts carried quite round indeed the breadth of a stone at bottom is seven feet and a half which is four cubits and a half Two stones, therefore, amount to nine cubits, and there is a cubit of interval between them, making in the whole ten cubits. But they were not careful of the particulars, only of the whole, in one of these compages or trilithons. The stones of the cell are made to diminish very much towards the top, most apparently with a design to take off from their weight and render them what we call top-heavy in a less degree. Hence the interval between the two upright stones of the compages widens so much upwards. This must certainly contribute very much to their stability. In assigning 20 feet for their height, Mr. Webb has well taken the medium. A very small matter, more than 20 feet, makes exactly 12 cubits of the Hebrews Egyptians and Druids. The reader remembers the proportion I assigned between the English foot and this cubit. Twenty inches and four fifths make a cubit. Therefore, twenty feet and four fifths make twelve cubits. The true case as to the height of the trilithons is thus respectively, and which may be seen in table. 15 with the harmony and symmetry in the proportion of the whole we may observe their gradual rising in height all from the same base like pillars of higher orders and more diameters but the intelligent reader must needs see that our founders never had sight of greek or roman pillars and never pretended to imitate them or take any one idea from them and of these three different orders or degrees of altitude in these trilithons one exceeds the other by a cubit 
So that their heights respectively are 13 cubits, 14 cubits, 15 cubits. The imposts of these trilithons are all of the same height. Mr. Webb, page 61, informs us the architrave lying on the top of the great stones of the hexagon and mortise also into them 16 foot long, 3 foot 9 inches broad, 3 foot 4 inches high. Mr. Webb's 16 foot long is too scanty, it amounting to 9 cubits and 2 palms. But the intent of the founders was to make these imposts equal both in length and breadth to the foundation of the upright stones that supports them. I mean the two stones at the bottom, the sustaining part of the compages, which in its whole breadth makes 10 cubits, and 10 cubits long the imposts are to be assigned. Most certainly, whoever undertake to measure them, whether from those fallen on the ground or still in their proper place, will be apt to fail in giving them just length, both because, one, tis observable that these imposts are formed somewhat broader upwards than in their bottom part, but this may not be taken notice of by everyone. This was done very judiciously upon an optical principle, which it is plain the founders were aware of, for a stone of so considerable an elevation by this means only presents its whole face in view. Therefore, they that measure it at bottom will not take its true length. 2. If they take the dimension, either from a stone still in its proper place, or from one fallen down, they will be very liable to shorten the measure, or in the first case, the upper edges of these imposts must needs have suffered from the weather in so elevated an exposure through the space of 2,000 years. It is very apparent they have suffered not a little. Large and deep furrows of age are visible all around them. But if they measure those fallen, they must well imagine such have doubly suffered from weather and from people every day diminishing all corners and edges to carry pieces away with them. So that in this case, analogy and symmetry only can supply these defeats. Thus we found before that the breadth of the imposts of the outer circle is equal to their ichnographical breadth. So it is here, being ten cubits. Besides, the outer face of these imposts is longer than the inner, as being in the larger circle. Therefore, ten cubits is to be understood their medium measure. The orthographical section of Stonehenge upon the cross diameter. Mr. Webb gives it as a general measure that they are three foot nine inches broad. He has before told us the uprights which support them were three foot nine thick. Take that twice and make seven foot and a half, which he assigns for the breadth of the uprights. This is all just within a trifle and it is not expected that he who was not aware of the cubit by which these works were made should do it with greater accuracy. The truth of the whole is this. Webb's seven foot and half is four cubits and a half. As we said before, the half of it is three foot nine and a very little more, but this must be taken for the least breadth of the imposts that at the ends for in the middle they are somewhat broader though the inside faces are straight yet as we observed in proper place of the imposts of the outer circle so here they are rounded behind their outer circumference answering to the great oval upon which they are founded so likewise their ends are made upon a radius of that oval whence the inner face of the impost is somewhat shorter than the outer and is another reason why their lengths may easily be taken somewhat too short i have drawn the imposts in their true shape in the ground plot the artifice of the tenons and the mortises for these trilithons 
and their imposts. What conformity they bear to that of the outer circle is exceedingly pretty, everything being done truly geometrically, and as would best answer every purpose for plain and simple principles. In the bottom face of the impost, if divided into three squares, the two mortises are made in the middle of the two outermost squares. Draw diagonal lines from corner to corner where they intersect is the center of the mortise, which central distance from one to the other is seven cubits of the druid measure. Each tenon is a cubit broad upon its longest diameter, for they are of an oval figure, an admirable contrivance that the impost should lie firm upon the heads of the uprights and keep the uprights steady in their places to strengthen and adorn. We may remark this pretty device in the management of the tenons and mortises. Cut an egg across upon its shortest diameter or conjugate. One half thereof represents the shape of the tenons of the outer circle. Cut it across upon its transverse diameter. One half is the shape of the tenons of the adidum. Tis evident the meaning of it is this. The tenons of the outer circle are higher in proportion than the others because the imposts are less and lower than the others, and on both accounts more liable to be disturbed, either by accident or violence, than the others. Therefore, more caution is used for their preservation. This is an instance of art, noble and simple withal. Mr. Webb says the imposts are three foot four inches high, which is precisely two cubits, a sixth part of the height of the medium order of trilithons, as the imposts of the outer circle are a sixth part of the height of the stones of the outer circle. The medium order of trilithons is above 24 foot high, i.e. 14 cubits. The lower order is 13 cubits, viz those next the entrance. The upper trilithon behind the altar was 15 cubits, each rising a cubit higher than the other, as we before observed. I promised to show the reader what Stonehenge is and what it was. The latter, I presume, is done in the four prints, table 12, 14, 15, and 16. Being geometric orthographical sections of the whole work, all necessary ways, such as architects prepare and design when they set about a building, it is wholly needless to spend many words in explaining them. What the work is of our didum at present is shown in the subsequent print, table 28, 21, 22. The fifth corresponds with the twelfth. The one shows the front of the temple when in perfection. The other is now in ruins. The 26th may be compared with 19 and 20, all presenting a view from the adidum towards the entrance. Table 18 is a contrary view when one standing by the entrance looks towards the adidum. The same is present in plate 7, which I call a peep into the sanctum sanctorum. 22 is the same, but a little oblique. This plate shows at present what the 14th does in its original. Plate 15 and 21 correspond, showing the adidum on one side in its perfect and in its ruinous state. Particularly, they explain what I spoke of as to the orderly rising of the trilithons in height, one above another, from the lower end to the upper end of the adidum. Table 22 illustrates it by exhibiting to view the other and most perfect side of the adidum. It is an oblique prospect of it from the entrance. The quantity of the solid is well adjusted in proportioning the stonework of this adidum to the intervals upon the ichnography. Each trilithon, each trilithon is 10 cubits and each interval about 6. The jams or vacuum of the entry expand themselves to 25 cubits, which is above 43 feet. From which measure my Lord Pembroke demonstrated the falsity of Webb's hexagonal scheme, 
when his lordship first did me the honor to discourse about Stonehenge. In Mr. Webb's designs, we find two jams, taking one trilithon away, expand but little above 31 feet by his own scales, though I don't pretend, but that some of my foregoing measures may here and there possibly vary a little upon a very strict trial and where proper judgment is not used because the stones in some parts may protuberate or great parts of them may have fallen off yet ten foot difference from truth cannot be allowed of in the plates nineteen and twenty observe the inside of that upright stone which makes the northern jam of the chief entrance of the outer circle a very great piece is fallen off towards the top which discovers its tenon and the mortise of the impost above it and in the management of such prodigious stones as these are fixed in the ground and rammed too like posts tis not to be wondered at if by chance we find some little variation though for my own part i observed none rather wondered how it was possible for them without lewis's and the like devices to set them in their places to such preciseness and the reader whose mind has received no prepossession cannot but be abundantly satisfied that the multitude of measures i have given from mr webb's own account are perfectly agreeable to the scale of cubits deduced from works of the egyptians and others and that in round and full numbers not trifling fractions if we collate the numbers given with the roman scale the measures appear very ridiculous and without design and that is a sure way of confuting the opinion of its being a roman work but as these stones are generally rough and by time must suffer in all dimensions is not practical to take their true measure without necessary judgment and relation add to symmetry of these greater stones of the adidum as i observed before there are none wanting they are all on the spot ten upright stones five cornishes the trilithon first on the left hand is entire in situ but vastly decayed especially the cornish there are such deep holes corroded in some places that daws make their nests in them the next trilithon on the left hand is entire composed of three most beautiful stones the cornish happened to be a very durable kind of english marble and has not been much impaired by weather my lord winchelsea and myself took a considerable walk on the top of it but it was a frightful situation the trilithon of the upper end of the adidum was an extraordinary beauty but alas through the indiscretion probably of somebody digging there between them and the altar the noble impost is dislodged from its airy seat and fallen upon the altar where its huge bulk lies unfractured resident in solidam longo post tempora terram pondus and exhibituit junctum cum viribus artem ovid met the two uprights that supported it are the most delicate stones of the whole work they were i believe above thirty foot long and well chiselled finely tapered and proportioned in their dimensions that southward is broken in two lying upon the altar the other still stands entire but leads upon one of the stones of the inward oval jam jam lapsira pedantit imminet assimilis the root end or unhewn part of both are raised somewhat above ground we cannot be sure of the true height of this when it was perfect but i am sure fifteen cubits which i have assigned is the lowest the next trilithon that toward the west is entire except that some of the end of the impost is falling clean off and all the upper edge is very much diminished by time as lucretius says 
Minui rem quamque vitimus et quasi longinco fuere omnia cernimus evil ex osiliqui vetustidum subdicure nostris. P28, table 25. The orthographic section of Stonehenge upon the chief diameter. The last turlathon, that on the right hand of the entrance into the adidum has suffered much the outer upright being the jam of the entrance is still standing the other upright and impost are both fallen forwards into the adidum and broke each into three pieces i suppose from digging near it but from one piece of the impost lying loose in the middle between the jams of the adidum mr webb in the plan of his ruins of stonehenge being his sixth scheme forms the remains of his imaginary six trilithon, exposing it one of the stones of the inner or lesser hexagon, as he calls it. Yet if this fragment was really a stump of such a stone as he would have it, still it would not create an hexagonal form of the cell, but stand just in the middle of the entrance and block it up in a very absurd, unseemly, in incommodious a manner, and nothing can be more certain than that there never was such a thing in being. That stone of the Trilithon which is standing has a cavity in it which two or three persons may sit in, worn by the weather. Stonehenge is composed of two circles and two ovals, respectively concentric at the distance of two cubits inward from the greater oval, describe another lesser oval on which the stones of the inner oval are to stand, nineteen stones in number, at about the central distance of three cubits. This lesser oval is to be described by a string and the two centers as before, or by two circles from a ten-cubit radius. And the two centers, A and B, as of the other before was spoken. Mr. Webb says, page 60, the stones of the hexagon within two foot six inches in breadth, one foot and a half thick, and eight foot high in form pyramidal. His two foot and a half is our cubit and half. For the breadth of these stones being but a third of the breadth of the stones of the greater oval, and the interval between stone and stone the same. Their height is likewise unequal, as the trilithons, for they rise in height as nearer the upper end of the adidum. Mr. Webb's eight foot assigned is a good medium measure, for it is just four cubits and four palms. The third part of the height of the medium trilithon, from the ruins of those left, we may well suppose the first next the entrance and lowest were four cubits high. The most advanced height behind the altar might be five cubits, and perhaps more. The stones are somewhat of what Mr. Webb calls a pyramidal form meaning that of an Egyptian obelisk, for they taper a little upwards. They are of a much harder sort than the other stones, as we spoke before, in the lesser circle. The founders provided that their lesser bulk should be compensated in solidity. They were brought somewhere from the west. Of these, there are only six remaining upright. The stumps of two are left on the south side by the altar. One lies behind the altar dug up or thrown down by the fall of that upright there. One or two were thrown down probably by the fall of the upright of the first trilithon on the right hand. A stump of another remains by the upright there, still standing. Their exact measures either as to height, breadth, or thickness cannot well be ascertained, for they took such as they could find, best suiting their scantlings, but the stones were better shaped and taller as advancing towards the upper end of the cell. End of chapter 5。Chapter 6 of Stonehenge, a temple restored to the British Druids. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kristen Hand. Stonehenge, a Temple Restored to the British Druids by William Stukeley. Chapter 6. Thus have we finished the work or principal part of this celebrated wonder, properly the temple or sacred structure as it may be called. Though its loftiest crest be composed but of one stone laid upon another, a work, as Mr. Webb says justly, page 65, built with much art, order, and proportion. And it must be owned that they who had a notion that it was an unworthy thing to pretend to confine the deity in room and space could not easily invent a grander design than this for sacred purposes, nor execute it in a more magnificent manner. Here space indeed is marked out and defined, but with utmost freedom and openness. Here is a Kebla imitating, but not bounding, the presence of the deity. Here the variety and harmony of four differing circles presents itself continually new, every step we take, with opening and closing light and shade. Which way soever we look, art and nature make a composition of their highest gusto, create a pleasing astonishment, very opposite to sacred places. The great oval consists of ten uprights, the inner with the altar of twenty, the great circle of thirty, the inner of forty. Ten, twenty, thirty, forty together, make one hundred upright stones. Five imposts of the great oval, thirty of the great circle, the two stones standing upon the bank of the area, the stone lying within the entrance of the area, and that standing without. There seems to have been another stone lying upon the ground, by the vallum of the court, directly opposite to the entrance of the avenue all added together make just 140 stones, the number of which Stonehenge, a whole temple, is composed. Behold the solution of the mighty problem, the magical spell is broke, which has so long perplexed the vulgar. They think tis an ominous thing to count the true number of the stones, and whoever does so shall certainly die after it. Thus the Druids contented themselves to live in huts and caves, whilst they employed many thousands of men, a whole country, to labor at these public structures dedicated to the deity. Our altar here is laid toward the upper end of the adytum, at present flat on the ground, and squeezed, as it were, into it, by the weight of the ruins upon it. Tis a kind of blue coarse marble such as comes from Derbyshire, and laid upon tombs in our churches and churchyards. Thus Virgil describes an ancient altar, after the Etruscan fashion, and which probably had remained from patriarchal times. Aedibus in medis noduce sub etheris axe, ingens ara fuit. Aeneid two. Servius, upon the third George, says in the middle of a temple was the place of the deity, the rest was only ornamental. This altar is placed a little above the focus of the upper end of the ellipsis. Mr. Webb says, page 56, the altar is four foot broad, sixteen in length. Four foot is two cubits, two palms, which at four times measures sixteen foot. I believe its breadth is two cubits, three palms, i.e. one and a half, and that its first intended length was ten cubits, equal to the breadth of the trilithon before which it lies. But tis very difficult to come at its true length. Tis twenty inches thick, just a cubit, and has been squared. It lies between the two centers, that of the compasses and that of the string, leaving a convenient space quite round it, no doubt, as much as was necessary for their ministration. Mr. Webb says, the heads of oxen and deer and other beasts have been found upon digging in and about Stonehenge, as divers then living could testify, 
undoubted relics of sacrifices together with much charcoal meaning wood ashes mr camden says men's bones have been found hereabouts he means in the barrows adjacent and i saw such thrown out by the rabbits very near the temple but eternally to be lamented is the loss of that tablet of tin which was found at this place in the time of king henry the eighth the era of restitution of learning and of pure religion inscribed with many letters but in so strange a character that neither sir thomas elliot a learned antiquary nor mr lilly master of st paul's school could make anything out of it mr sams may be in the right who judges it to have been punic i imagine if we call it irish we shall not err much no doubt but it was a memorial of the founders wrote by the druids and had it been preserved till now would have been an invaluable curiosity to make the reader some amends for such a loss i have given a specimen of supposed druid writing out of lambesius's account of the emperor's library at vienna tis wrote on a very thin plate of gold with a sharp pointed instrument it was in an urn found at vienna rolled up in several cases of other metal together with a funeral exuve it was thought by the curious one of those epistles which the celtic people were wont to send to their friends in the other world so certain a hope of a future state had the druids infused into them the reader may divert himself with endeavouring to explain it the writings upon plates of gold or tin is exceeding ancient as we see in job chapter nineteen verse twenty four plutarch in his pamphlet de daemonio socrates tells a similar story about the time of aegislaus they found a brazen tablet in the sepulchre of alcmena at thebes wrote in characters unknown but seemed to be egyptian conufus the most learned of the egyptian prophets then being consulted upon it confirmed it and said it was wrote about the time of hercules and proteus king in egypt tzitzis chill to hist forty four mentions proteus a king in lower egypt by the seaside pretends he was a son of neptune and phoenicia throwing him up thereby to very ancient times those of the first famous navigators our hercules and the phoenicians he is said to have lived in the island afterward called pharos from the watch-tower there erected here homer sings that proteus diverts himself with his fosse or sea-calves most undoubtedly his ships but at that time of day everything new and strange was told by the greeks in a mythologic way in the year sixteen thirty five as they were ploughing by the barrows about normanton ditch they found a large quantity of excellent pewter as much as they sold at a low price for five l says mr aubrey in his manuscript collections relating to antiquities of this sort there are several of these ditches being very small in breadth which run across the downs i take them for boundaries of hundreds parishes etc such as the reader may observe in my plate thirty one of the barrows in lakefield i suspect this too was a tablet with an inscription on it but falling into the hands of the countrymen they could no more discern the writing than interpret it no doubt but this was some of the old british stanum which the tyrian hercules surnamed melcarthus first brought ex cassiteride insula or britain which hercules lived in abraham's time or soon after mr webb tells us the duke of buckingham dug about stonehenge i fear much to the prejudice of the work he himself did the like and found what he imagined was the cover of a theribulum he would have done well to have given us a drawing of it but whatever it was vases of incense oil flour salt wine and holy water were used by all nations in their religious ceremonies mr thomas hayward late owner of stonehenge dug about it as he acquainted lord winchelsea and myself he found heads of oxen and other beast bones and nothing else in seventeen twenty four when i was there richard haynes an old man of ambresbury whom i employed to dig for me in the barrows 
found some little worn out roman coins at stonehenge among the earth rooted up by the rabbits he sold one of them for half a crown to mr merrill of golden square who came thither whilst i was at the place the year before haynes was one of the workmen employed by lord carleton to dig clay on harradon hill east of ambrusbury where they found many roman coins which i saw i suspect he pretended to find those at stonehenge only for sake of the reward my friend the late dr harwood of doctor's commons told me he was once at stonehenge with such sort of roman coins in his pockets and that one of his companions would have persuaded him to throw some of them into the rabbit holes but the doctor was more ingenuous nevertheless were never so many such coins found in stonehenge they would prove nothing more than that the work was in being when the romans were here and which we are assured of already i have a brass coin given me by john collins esq collector of the excise at stamford the heads of julius and augustus averse the reverse a crocodile palm branch and garland colonel nem the colony of namassus and france it was found upon salisbury plain and might be lost there before the roman conquest of britain under claudius by the people of france coming hither or in after ages no matter which july fifth seventeen twenty three by lord pembroke's direction i dug on the inside of the altar about the middle four foot along the edge of the stone six foot forward toward the middle of the attitum at a foot deep we came to the solid chalk mixed with flints which had never been stirred the altar was exactly a cubit thick twenty inches and four-fifths but broken into two or three pieces by the ponderous masses of the impost and one upright stone of that trilithon which stood at the upper end of the attitum being fallen upon it hence appears the commodiousness of the foundation for this huge work they dug holes in the solid chalk which would of itself keep up the stones as firm as if a wall was built round them and no doubt but they rammed up the interstices with flints but i had too much regard to the work to dig anywhere near the stones i took up an ox's tooth above ground without the attitude on the right hand of the lowermost trilithon northward and this is all the account of what has been found by digging at stonehenge which i can give End of chapter 6chapter seven of stonehenge a temple restored to the british druids this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by kristen hand stonehenge a temple restored to the british druids by william stukeley chapter seven of the court round the temple of stonehenge somewhat is said already and of the two stones standing within the vallum and of the two cavities remarkable which have some correspondency therewith i supposed they were places where two great vases of water stood for the service of the temple when they performed religious rites here and i endeavoured to illustrate it by a coin of the city heliopolis sixty cubits is the diameter of stonehenge sixty more reaches the inner edge of the circular ditch of the court the ditch originally was near thirty cubits broad but through long tract of time in the infinity of coaches horses etc coming every day to see the place tis levelled very much the entire diameter of the court reaching to the outward verge of the ditch is four times sixty cubits which is about four hundred ten foot the five outer circles of the ditch are struck with a radius of eighty ninety one hundred one hundred ten one hundred twenty cubits just upon the inner verge of the ditch at the entrance from the avenue lies a very large stone at present flat on the ground mr webb page fifty seven pretends to give us the measure of it confounding it with the two other before mentioned to be within the vallum to which they have no relation no similarity in proportion this is to favor his notion of three entrances of the area dependent upon his hypothesis of equilateral triangles he there tells us at the letter f 
the parallel stones on the inside of the trench were four foot broad and three foot thick but they lie so broken and ruined by time that their proportion in height cannot be distinguished much less exactly measured thus he but tis in vita minerva for all three stones in all appearance are as little altered from their first size as any stones in the work the two stones within the vallum are very small stones and ever were so the one stands the other leans a little probably from some idle people digging about it this stone at the entrance is a very great one near as big as any one of the whole work and seems too as little altered from its original form only thrown down perhaps by the like foolish curiosity of digging near it instead of webs four foot broad it's near seven but to speak in the druid measure four cubits it is at present above twenty foot long if it stood originally and a little leaning it was one of those stones which the welsh call crim lecken or bowing stones however mr webb must falsify the truth very much in making this and the two former anything alike in dimension situation and use but he does so much more in the next which is doubtless a creme lech still standing in its original posture and place in the avenue tis of much the like dimension as the other though not so shapely and stands in like manner on the left hand or south of the middle line of the length of the avenue i surmise the druids considered the propriety of making the other a little more shapely than this because within the area and nearer the sacred fabric there is the distance of one hundred nineteen feet between them to speak properly eighty cubits this interval mr webb contracts to about forty-three foot and supposes there was another stone to answer it on the right hand as also another to answer that on the inside the ditch and he supposes the like of those before mentioned both within and without the ditch at his two fancied entrances but of these there is nec vola nec vestigium and i dare say never was this stone has a hole in it which is observable of like stones set thus near our like temples as we shall see in the progress of this work the stone is of twenty-four foot in circumference sixteen high above the ground nine broad six thick the use of it i can't certainly tell but i am inclined to think that as part of the religious worship in old patriarchal times consisted in a solemn adoration or three silent bowings the first bowing might be performed at this stone just without the ditch the second perhaps at the next stone just within the ditch then they turned by that stone to the left hand as the manner was in a procession round the temple both the priests and animals for sacrifice at those two stones and water vases probably there were some washings lustrations or sprinklings with holy water and other ceremonies which i don't pretend to ascertain then upon the entry into the temple perhaps they made the third bow as in presence of the deity after this in the court we may suppose the priest prepared the hecatombs and customary sacrifices if that great stone just within the ditch always lay as it does now flat on the ground and in situ which i am not unwilling to believe then i apprehend it was a table for dressing the victims ezekiel in describing the temple of jerusalem speaks of such in the entry chapter forty verses thirty forty forty one forty two forty three tis just to think the ancient form of sacrificing here like that of the romans greeks or elder nations was pretty much the same as that among the jews and that as in patriarchal times and in short no other than the original practice of mankind since the first institution of sacrifices at the fall therefore we shall subjoin it from homer's description in iliad one it quadrates extremely well in all appearance with the place and temple before us straight away in haste a chosen hecatomb to god prepared the well-built altar round they place in order then their hands they wash and take the salted meal allowed the priest with hands uplifted 
for the assembly praise. After the prayers, they waved the salted meal, and then retiring, slay the animals. The skins being stripped, they cut off both the thighs and cover them with cowl, first offered crude. The priest then burns as part on plates, thereon red wine, libation poured. The ministering young men stand by him with their fivefold spits in hand, but when the thighs are burnt, out of the rest, entrails and flesh, harslets and stakes they make, upon the spit transfixed. Then roasted well they set all forth. After the duty done, a feast they next prepare. Plenty of food distributed around, cheerful repast. Banquet being o'er, the youths huge goblets crown and fill to all in cups. Then sacred hymns sung to the deity conclude the day. In another place he adds, with choice cloven bits of wood without leaves. These are most ancient rites, symbolical of the purity of the sacrifice of the Messiah, pointed at, by, and derived from the Mosaic dispensation, where everything of sacred purpose was to be perfect. Thus it is much sufficient to give the reader an idea of the ancient manner of sacrificing, such no doubt as was practiced at this very place entirely the Hebrew rite. I suppose only the priests and chief personages came within the area, who made the procession with the sacrifices along the avenue. The multitude kept without, on foot or in their chariots. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Stonehenge, A Temple Restored to the British Druids This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kristen Hand Stonehenge, A Temple Restored to the Druids by William Stukeley 8. The avenue of Stonehenge was never observed by any who have wrote of it, though a very elegant part of it, and very apparent. It answers, as we have said before now, to the principal line of the whole work, the northeast, where about the sun rises, when the days are longest. Plutarch, in the life of Numa, says, the ancients observed the rule of setting their temples with the front to meet the rising sun. Promachetus of Heracleum and Dionysus Thrax take notice of the same thing. And this was done in imitation of the Mosaic Tabernacle and Solomon's Temple, probably a patriarchal rite. This avenue extends itself somewhat more than 1,700 feet in a straight line down to the bottom of the valley with a delicate descent. I observe the earth of the ditches is thrown inward, and seemingly some turf on both sides thrown upon the avenue, to raise it a little above the level of the downs. The two ditches continue perfectly parallel to the bottom, forty cubits asunder. About midway there is a pretty depressure, natural, which diversifies it agreeably. Stonehenge, I said, is not on the highest part of the hill. I found the reason why the Druids set it just where it is, because it is precisely 1,000 cubits from the bottom to the entrance of the area. When I began my inquiries into this noble work, I thought it terminated here, and Mr. Roger Gale and myself measured it so far with a chain. Another year I found it extended itself much farther. For at the bottom of the valley it divides into two branches. The eastern branch goes a long way hence, directly east, pointing to an ancient ford of the river Avon, called Radfin, and beyond that the visto of it bears directly to Herodon Hill beyond the river. The western branch, from this termination at the bottom of the hill, 1,000 cubits from the work at Stonehenge, as we said, goes off with a similar sweep at first, but then it does not throw itself into a straight line immediately, as the former, but continues curving along the bottom of the hill till it meets what I call the cursus. This, likewise, is a new unobserved curiosity belonging to this work, and very much enlarges the idea we ought to entertain, of the magnificence and prodigious extent of the thing. 
the temple which we have been hitherto describing considerable indeed as it really is in itself yet now appears as a small part of the whole i shall therefore describe all these parts separately to render them more intelligible and then show their connection and what relation they have to one another as well as i can but it is not easy to enter at once into the exceeding greatness of thought which these people had who founded it bringing in all the adjacent country the whole nature hereabouts to contribute its parts to the work therefore i shall discourse of it backward and forward first going from stonehenge to its termination or more properly its beginning and then return again explaining all the way what is its present condition and what tis reasonable to suppose was its original when the druids made their first design this together with the several views i have drawn of it will give us nearly as good a notion of the whole as we can at this day expect and perhaps preserve the memory of it hereafter when the traces of this mighty work are obliterated with the plough which it is to be feared will be its fate that instrument gaining too much ground upon the ancient and innocent pastoral life hereabouts and everywhere else in england and by destructive enclosures beggars and depopulates the country at the bottom of the valley at the end of the straight part of stonehenge avenue one thousand cubits from stonehenge as we said the eastern wing of the avenue turns off to the right with a circular sweep and then in a straight line proceeds eastward up the hill it goes just between those two most conspicuous groups of barrows crowning the ridge of that hill eastward of stonehenge between it and vespasian's camp separated from them both by a deep valley on each side these two groups of barrows are called generally the seven kings graves each i call that most northerly the old seven kings graves for there are really seven though but six most apparent they are all set at greater distance all broader flatter and as it is most reasonable to suppose older than the other the other are set closer together of a more elegantly turned figure companioniform and in all appearance much later than the former therefore i call these being southward and directly between stonehenge and the town of ambresbury the new seven kings barrows of the seven old the most northerly one and probably the oldest is exceeding flat and as it were almost sunk into the earth with age so that it is scarce visible at a distance the avenue runs up to the top of the hill just between them and they make as it were wings to it and i believe were designed as such when set there when the avenue first turns off in the valley it is much obscured by the wheels of carriages going over it for a great way together for this is the road to lavington nevertheless a curious eye without difficulty sees all the traces of it sufficiently till it has got higher up the easy ascent of the hill and out of the common road then it is very apparent and consists of the two little ditches as before when coming directly from stonehenge exactly parallel and still forty cubits asunder and it is made with the same degree of variation or about six degrees southward from the true east point so that it is evident again the druids intended that it should go full east but their compass by which they set it varied so much at that time according to my opinion of the matter to perpetuate the mark of it as much as i can i measured the distance of it from the southern ditch thereof to the ditch of the nearest i e the most northerly of the new seven kings barrows and when in the right line of those seven barrows it is two hundred fifty seven feet i know not whether there was any design in it but it is exactly one hundred fifty cubits from the northern ditch of the avenue here to the nearest of the old seven kings barrows it is three hundred fifty foot which is exactly two hundred cubits whilst we are here upon the elevation of this hill between these two groups of barrows tis two thousand seven hundred feet from the beginning of this wing of the avenue at the bottom of the valley where it commences it still continues in the very same direction eastward till unfortunately broke off by the ploughed ground three hundred feet from hence this ploughed ground continues for a mile together as far as the river's side at ambresbury so that tis impossible to trace it any farther the first ploughed field that southward is mr hayward's the other is of a different estate called countess farm 
and the ploughing of these two go on at right angles one of another that piece on the north side of the avenue of the latter tenure goes along the line of the avenue is long and narrow and has as usual with greedy farmers encroached upon and swallowed up so much of the length of the avenue and that amounts to seven hundred fifty feet more in length which must certainly be added to the avenue this is all along the eastern declivity of the hill we are upon that of the twice seven kings graves and reaches near the bottom of the valley between it and the hill whereon stands vespasian's camp now reason and the judgment i have got in conversing with works of this time tell me the founders would never begin this avenue at the bottom of a valley but rather on a conspicuous height which is visible from a great distance of country round we must suppose the intent of the avenue was to direct the religious procession to the temple and that at the beginning of it they made fires early in the morning of that day when they held their grand festivals to give notice to all the adjacent country therefore when we cross this valley still eastward with the former direction of the compass and mount that next hill whereon stands vespasian's camp we find exactly such a place as we could wish and extremely suitable to that purpose for it commands a very extensive prospect both upwards and downwards of the river and on the other side of it for many miles all about that part of the country where it is highly reasonable to think the old britons lived who frequented this temple this eminence is north of vespasian's camp northwest from ambrusbury church here is a very large scene of the country taken in it has a fine gentle rise for half a mile and more even quite from the ford at radfin you see the most delightful river avon flanked with villages on both sides from almost as far as new sarum and then to the head of it five miles off it was the custom of the druids to give notice by fires of the quarterly days of sacrifice thus the druids in ireland before christianity used to kindle a fire called in their language chlachjada on all saints eve to perform a general sacrifice as mr lloyd mentions in his irish dictionary mr toland speaks of others too i observed there has been a bank across the bottom of the valley for the more easy passage of the religious ceremony and this much corroborates my conjecture of the avenue reaching hither plate twenty four explains all that i have last said about this avenue and shows its direction to harridan hill on the other side of the river i am apt to believe from the conformity i have observed in these works that there was a sacellum or a little temple here upon this hill where the avenue began we suppose this might easily be destroyed when they began to plough here being so near to the town i found several of these kind of large stones either travelling to stonehenge or from it one as big as any at stonehenge lies about three miles off northward in durrington fields another in the water at milford another at figheldon they seem to have been carried back to make bridges midlands or the like in the river there is another in the london road east from ambrusbury about two mile from the town another in the water at bulford a stone stands leaning at preshute farm near the church as big as those at stonehenge what confirms me in the conjecture that there was a sacellum here originally is that an innumerable company of barrows on the opposite hill on the other side of the river coming down harridan and in the line of the avenue seem to regard it as is usual in these works for those barrows are not in sight of stonehenge itself by reason of the interposition of the hill whereon stand the double groups of seven kings graves and even those two groups seem to regard this little temple as well as the great one curving that way the distance from hence to stonehenge is four thousand cubits in order to have a just notion of this avenue it is necessary to go to the neighboring height of harridan hill on the other side of the river the largest barrow there which i call harras and which probably gave the name to the hill is in the line of the avenue the ford of radfin lying between as we see in the last plate i stood upon this hill may eleventh seventeen twenty four during the total eclipse of the sun of which i gave an account in my itinerarium here is a most noble view of the work and country about stonehenge whoever is upon the spot cannot fail of great pleasure in it especially if the sun be low either after rising or before setting for by that means the barrows 
the only ornaments of these plains become very visible the ground beyond them being illuminated by the sun's slanting rays you see as far as clay hill beyond warminster twenty miles off you see the spot of ground on the hill whereon stands vespasian's camp where i conjecture the avenue to stonehenge began and where there was a sesellum as we conceive from hence to that spot a valley leads very commodiously to radfin where the original ford was this radfin farm seems to retain its celtic name meaning a ford or passage for chariots the old way of carriage here used redeg carere redeg fein cursitare in irish raithem finn in the old irish is white it regards the chalky road which went up from the ford tis a pretty place seated in a flexure of the river which from hence seems to bend its arms both ways to embrace the beginning of the avenue the place is very warm sheltered from all winds and especially from the north i am persuaded it was originally a seat of an arch druid or druid see mr toland discoursing of the druids houses page one eleven the nuns of ambrosbury too had a chapel there the ford is now quite disused because of the bridge by the town's end and the road of it is foreclosed by hedgerows of pastures on both sides of the lane leading northwards from ambrosbury to north wiltshire this road lying between radfin and the beginning of stonehenge avenue is sweetly adorned with viorna we are supposed now to stand on the tumulus of hara an old irish royal name and possibly the king who was coadjutor in founding stonehenge who lived it is likely in the eastern part of wiltshire for which reason they directed the avenue this way et nunc serva honos sedum tuus osake nomen here are very many barrows upon this side of the hill all looking toward the sacred work hence we survey ambersbury vespasian's camp and stonehenge the cursus and little ambersbury likewise a very ancient barrow which answers to that of vespasian's camp seeming to be placed here with some regularity and regard to the sacellum at the beginning of the avenue this is a long barrow which i suppose the archdruids who lived at radfin and perhaps the chief person concerned in projecting the magnificent work the reader must indulge me the liberty of these kind of conjectures there is no evidence positive left in such matters of great antiquity i have some little reason for it which i shall mention when we speak of the barrows there is this present use to affix thereby names to things that we may talk more intelligibly about them we are next to advance down harridan hill in the same direction nearer radfin from whence i drew plate twenty five this valley leads us very gently to the river qua se subducier colles incipiunt molice hugum dimitere clivo usque ad aquanum virgil this and the two views in plate twenty six give us a good notion of the country on this side there are seven barrows together in the road from ambersbury to radfin one great one and six little ones which regard the sacellum but cannot possibly to stonehenge this was a family burying place probably of some considerable personage who lived at ambersbury these plates show us too the avenue marching up the next hill where the old and new seven kings barrows receive it again as wings to it this is shown more distinct in the next plate table twenty seven where the corn ground has begun to encroach upon it i could scarce forbear the wish periat labor iritus ami when you are gone a little farther toward stonehenge and arrived at the top of the hill if you turn back you have the view presented to you like that table twenty four beyond a the beginning of the avenue is radfin beyond that harridan the prospect forward toward stonehenge is shown table twenty eight there you see the union of the two wings of the avenue at the commencement of the straight part of it c again you may observe the nature of the west wing of the avenue going with a continued curve round the bottom of the hill till it enters the hippodrome or cursus at a distance you see yensbury camp thought to be another of vespasian's 
next you descend into the valley to the union of the wings of the avenue and ascend the agreeable part of it to the temple along here went the sacred pomp how would it delight one to have seen it in its first splendor yam nunc solenes ducere pompas ad delubra juvat sesque videre juvencos virgil i have often admired the delicacy of this ascent to the temple as soon as you mount from the bottom tis level for a great way together and the whole length of it is a kind of ridge for it slopes off both ways from it on each side so that the rain runs off every way just about halfway there is a depression as a pause or foot pace showing one half of the avenue ascending the other descending both magnificent in the ancient gusto there was a temple of jupiter labradeus near malasa a city of caria much frequented the way leading thither was called sacred and paved sixty furlongs through which their procession went philostratus says you went to the temple of diana at ephesus by a stone portico of a stadium pausanias in phocesis says the avenue to the temple of minerva crania near alatia is ascending but so gently that it is imperceptible again in chapter ten we read of a paved way to the oracle at delphos but the natural pavement of our avenue is much finer i take notice that jupiter labradeus was a statue holding a halberd in his hand which instrument like a securius or amazonian axe was as a scepter to the lydian kings and apparently our english halberd is the very word with an aspirate way of pronunciation prefixed labrada so our druids carried about a sharp brass instrument which we often find called a celt i know not whence with which they used to cut the mistletoe at their great festival in midwinter i have represented one hanging at our druid's girdle in table one it was to be put into the slit at the end of his staff when used but of this hereafter now with the poet in his celebrated ode quibus mos unde deductus por omne tempus amazonia securi dextras oberme quicere distuli nec sire fas est omnia horat being arrived again at stonehenge from the last print table twenty eight through small we may see the beauty of the curve in the outer circle of that work especially from the avenue when the eye is below it we observe the same in the ground front view table five and now we are returned to the sacred fabric we will discourse a little upon these temples in general and so conclude this chapter in microbe saturn one eighteen mention is made of a famous round temple in thrace where they celebrate most magnificent religious rites it is upon the hill zilmissus the temple is open at the top i suppose like ours not a little round hole like as in the pantheon nor is it a small round sacellum like those little round temples at rome to romulus to vesta etc it is not reasonable to think that they should build a pantheon in thrace nor can i understand it otherwise than that it was like our stonehenge and in truth an ancient patriarchal structure of a primitive model the deity here worshipped was called sabasius says he some make him jupiter some the sun some bacchus these are the first perversions of the jehovah of the jews in my judgment the name sabasius is a corruption of the hebrew name of god sivaot sabaot deus exortium a title that would well suit the warlike thracians in time idolatry debased everything when they performed the religious rites of bacchus they cried evohe sabai and called him evius evan sabazius etc evohe is a corrupt manner of pronouncing Iova jehovah and this sacred cry is truly no other than what frequently occurs in holy scripture Iova zvaot jehovah saboth 
He is the King of Glory, Psalm 24.10. But I have discoursed on this head in my Paleographica Sacra, number one, which will be continued. Dodorus Siculus, in his book two, mentions a very eminent temple of a round form among the Hyperboreans, as he calls them, who inhabit an island situate in the ocean over against Gaul, which is not less than Sicily. He gives an odd account from thence, mixed with fable, and seemingly some reports of Stonehenge itself. Mr. Toland is confident this Hyperborean region is our Shetland Isles, whence Abarus the Druid and Hyperborean philosopher, famous in a Grecian story, Whilst I am writing this, March 6, 1739-40, to 40, we had an account read before the Royal Society much confirming Mr. Toland's notion, speaking of the admirable temperature of the air there, not subject to such extremities, such sudden changes, as even in Britain itself. There are such temples as ours out there. Arnobius, in 6, speaking of the origin of temples, we don't, says he, make temples to the gods as if we designed to shelter them from the rain, the wind, and the sun, but that we may therein present ourselves before them, and by our prayers, after a sort, speak to them as if present. We may well affirm this of our temple, built after the manner of the patriarchal ones, though probably an improvement, and somewhat more magnificent. Ours consists of two ovals and two circles many in our island, which I suppose older than Stonehenge, consist of one oval, or niche-like figure made of three stones only, of which our adytum is a more magnificent specimen, and a circle of rude stones fixed in the ground, of which our work, crowned with a circular cornish, is a more magnificent specimen. Sometime I meet with a niche without a circle, sometime a circle without a niche. We may well say the circle is analogous to our chapels, churches, or cathedrals, according to their different magnitude. The niches correspond to our choirs, altars, and more sacred part of the sacred building, the more immediate place of the residence of the deity. They are what now the Turks and Arabians call the Kebla, derived, as we said before, from the patriarchal practice, and particularly from the great patriarch Abraham. I doubt not, but the altars which he and his posterity made, mentioned in scripture, were a stone upon the ground before three set in a niche-like figure, and the whole enclosed in a circle of stones. At other times they set only one stone for a kebla, as sometime our ancestors did likewise. This practice was propagated generally among all ancient nations. Among many it was forgotten or not practiced, where they had but little religion at all. Among others, after idolatry had prevailed with them, they thought all former manners of worship like their own, and mistook the stones, which were kevlas or places of worship, for the objects of worship. Hence Maximus of Tyre says the Arabians worshipped he knew not what, for he saw only a great stone, which, no doubt, was the kebla toward which they directed their devotion, as they had learnt from Abraham, or the like patriarchal ancestors. So Pausanias in Achaicus says, the ancient Greeks worshipped unhewn stones instead of statues, more particularly among the Fari, near the statue of Mercury, were thirty square stones which they worshipped. If our author could not make his narration agreeable to common sense, he might well mistake this ancient patriarchal temple, somewhat like ours of Stonehenge, for a circle of deities, he himself being a stranger to any other than image worship. I shall handle this matter more largely hereafter, and now let us descend again from the temple to the curses. Only I would close this chapter with this short reflection. This avenue is proof enough, if there needed any, that our work is a temple, not a monument, as some writers would have it, but it requires no formal confutation. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Stonehenge, a Temple Restored to the British Druids. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stonehenge, a Temple Restored to the British Druids by William Stukeley. 
Chapter 9 About half a mile north of Stonehenge, across the first valley, is the Cursus, or Hippodrome, which I discovered August 6, 1723. Tis a noble monument of antiquity, and illustrates very much the preceding account of Stonehenge. It was the universal custom to celebrate games, feasts, exercises, and sports at their more public and solemn meetings to sacrifice, which was done quarterly and anniversarily at certain stated seasons of the year. Macrobe, Satter I, says, Upon holy days dedicated to the gods, there are sacrifices, feasts, games, and festivals. For a sacred solemnity is, when sacrifices are offered to the gods, or holy feasting celebrated, or games performed to their honor, or when holy days are observed. This great work is included between two ditches running east and west in a parallel, which are 350 foot asunder. When I mention 350 foot, I speak in the gross, and as we should set it down in an English scale. But if we look into plate six, where I have given a comparative view of our English foot and the most ancient cubit, at first sight we discern this measure means two hundred of the druid cubits. This cursus is a little above ten thousand foot long. That is, it is made of six thousand druid cubits in length. A most noble work, contrived to reach from the highest ground of two hills, extended the intermediate distance over a gentle valley, so that the whole cursus lies conveniently under the eye of the most numerous quantity of spectators. To render this more convenient for sight, it is projected on the side of rising ground, chiefly looking southward toward Stonehenge. A delightful prospect from the temple, when this vast plain was crowded with chariots, horsemen, and foot, attending these solemnities with innumerable multitudes. This cursus, which is two miles long, has two entrances, as it were, gaps being left in the two little ditches. And these gaps, which are opposite to each other in the two ditches, are opposite to the straight part of Stonehenge Avenue. I mentioned before that at the bottom of the straight part of Stonehenge Avenue, in the valley, the avenue divides itself into two parts. One goes directly east towards Radfin, the other goes northwestward, and enters our cursus nearly at the same distance west from the gaps or entrances before mentioned, as those gaps are from the east end of the Hippodrome. These gaps being at a convenient distance from that east end may be thought to be in the nature of distance posts. It seems to me that the turf of the adjacent ground on both sides has been originally taken off, and laid on the whole length of this cursus, because it seemed somewhat higher and level. Though this was an incredible labor, yet a fine design for the purpose of running. The earth of the vallum is likewise thrown inward. The east end of the cursus is composed of a huge body of earth, a bank or long barrow, thrown up nearly the whole length of the cursus. This seems to be the plain of session, for the judges of the prizes and chief of the spectators. The west end of the cursus is curved into an arch, like the end of the Roman circuses, and there, probably, the chariots ran round, in order to turn again, and there is an obscure barrow or two, round which they returned, as it were, a meta. This is the finest piece of ground that can be imagined for the purpose of a horse race. The whole is commanded by the eye of a spectator in any part. In the middle is a valley, and pretty steep at present, yet only so, as that a British charioteer may have a good opportunity of showing that dexterity spoken of by Caesar. But the exquisite softness of the turf prevents any great damage by a fall. The ground of it hereabouts declines somewhat northward. The main part of this hippodrome is upon a gentle ridge running east and west. This rendered the place cooler. On the southern ridge, toward the west end of it, are many considerable barrows, but none towards the east end, for that would obstruct the view of Stonehenge. There are many barrows, but of no considerable bulk, on the north side, upon the extensive ascent toward the great north long barrow. This magnificent work of the cursus is drawn due east and west, except a small variation of four or five degrees southward from the east. If we measure along the bank, from the eastern meta, at seven hundred cubits exactly, we come over against the middle line of the straight part of the avenue to Stonehenge. Five hundred cubits further conducts us to the gaps or opposite entrances I before mentioned which we suppose as distance posts. The whole interval between the eastern meta and these gaps is 1,200 cubits. At 1,000 cubits more, we come to the place where the west wing of the avenue enters the southern ditch of the cursus. 
That west wing, too, is just 1,000 cubits long to its union with the straight part of the Stonehenge Avenue. Likewise, the straight part of Stonehenge Avenue is just 1,000 cubits long, as mentioned in its proper place. This west wing begins in the bottom of that valley, which crosses the middle of the Cursus, and sweeping along by the bottom of the hill in a gentle curve, meets with the lower end of the straight part of Stonehenge Avenue, where the wing or avenues unite to it with an equal angle, so that the whole work is laid out with great judgment and symmetry, and curiously adapted to the ground, which was well considered before the plot was marked out by the first surveyors. From the bottom of the valley crossing the middle of the Cursus, to the western meta, is 3,800 cubits more, making in the whole 6,000 cubits. The north end of the eastern meta does not extend so far as the northern bank of the Cursus. I suppose the reason is that there might be a liberty that way to stop the horses at the end of the course. Therefore they set out on the southern side of the Cursus and returned by the north side. I observed the ditch and bank toward the eastern end of the Cursus much obscured by the trampling of men and horses frequenting the spectacles here, this being the most thronged. The Cursus is directly north from Stonehenge so exactly that the meridian line of Stonehenge passes precisely through the middle of the Cursus. And when we stand at the grand entrance of Stonehenge and observe the two extremities of the Cursus, the eastern and western meta, they are each exactly sixty degrees from the meridian line on each hand, making a third part of a circle of the horizon, by which we see the Druids well understood the geometry of a circle and its measure of three hundred and sixty parts. Pausanias, in the Yotic, says... Among the Thebans, by the gate Protus, is the gymnasium Jalus, and likewise the stadium, which is the bank of earth thrown up, such as that at Olympia and that of the Lori. In the same place is the heroical monument of Jalus. A little beyond, to the right, is the Hippodrome, and in it Pindar's monument. The same author, in Arcade 8, writes, that before the walls of Antonia, in a field, was a stadium made for horse races, in honor of Antinous. Not far from it was the temple of Neptunus, Equestrius, and others. So that we see it was the manner of the ancient Greeks thus to define their places for sports by banks of earth, and that near their temples. After the Romans had borrowed the use of the British chariots for traveling and the like, they used them too in the Circentian games. Thus Sidonius Apollinaris, his poem upon it, Lib. 22, Instant Barberibus, Simul Regentes, Gemque Epectora, Prona di Convino, Extensio Rapiuntur. Again, Tuncotus Juvenum, sed Alicorum, E Loi Simacra, Torva Carapi, Extension, Speciensibus Quadrigus, Tandemumera Pucanio Strapentis, Suspensis Tubicum Vulcans Quadrigus, E Fundit Cerlas in Arva Curus, Hic Agia Sonat, Hic Arar Resultant, Hic se se pedis ate equus reflectit, stridentum et moderator estendorum. Such, we may well imagine, was the scene of this place in ancient days. And as the poet mentions the river Ara, I may take notice in passing that I have seen several other places of sports and racing, which I take to have belonged to the ancient Britons, as particularly those two great banks called Rawdykes in the meadow near Leicester, which spectators look on as unaccountable. Another such work I have seen in the meadow by Dorchester, the ancient Roman city and Episcopal see, in Oxfordshire. Both are by the side of rivers. Another upon the river Lother, by Perith in Cumberland. These places by rivers were more agreeable to the Greek taste, as in a hotter country. Another like place of sports was in the chalky valley just without the town of Royston, on the south side of it by the London Road. The old Roman road there, or Herman Street, passes over one corner of the work as being of later date. I may, perhaps, describe these more largely another time. We read in Homer and Virgil that races were celebrated at funerals. End of chapter 9 Recording by Todd Chapter 10 of Stonehenge A Temple Restored to the British Druids this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stonehenge, A Temple Restored to the British Druids, by William Stukeley. 
Chapter 10 I come in the last place to speak of the barrows, observable in great numbers round Stonehenge. We may very readily count fifty at a time, in sight, from the place. Easily distinguishable. But especially in the evening, when the sloping rays of the sun shine on the ground beyond them. These barrows are the artificial ornaments of this vast and open plain, and it is no small entertainment for a curious person to remark their beauties, their variety in form and magnitude, their situation. They are generally of a very elegant, capiniform shape, and done with great nicety. There is likewise a great variety in their shape, and turn, and in their diameters, in their matter of composition. In general, they are always upon elevated ground, and in sight of the Temple of Stonehenge, for they all regard it. This shows they are but superficial inspectors of things that fancy from hence great battles on the plain, and that these are the tumultuary burials of the slain. Quite otherwise, they are assuredly the single sepulchres of kings and great personages, buried during a considerable space of time, and that in peace. There are many groups of them together, and as family burial places, the variety in them seems to indicate some noted difference in the persons there interred, well known in those ages. Probably the priests and laity were some way distinguished, as well as different orders and stations in them. Most of the barrows have little ditches round, extremely well defined. In many is a circular ditch sixty cubits in diameter, with a very small tumulus in the center. Sixty or a hundred cubits is a very common diameter in the large barrows. Often, they are set in rows and equidistant, so as to produce a regular and pretty appearance, and with some particular regard to the parts of the temple, the avenues, or the cursus. For instance, where the avenue begins at the first elevation from the Radfin Ford, advancing toward Stonehenge, seven large and flat old barrows are on the right hand of the avenue toward the east end of the cursus. Seven large barrows of a newer shape are on the left hand, both these groups before spoken of are placed in a similar manner in regard to the avenue, and as wings or openings to it. Upon every range of hills, quite round Stonehenge, are successive groups of barrows for some miles, and we may even observe that great barrow by Lord Pembroke's part at Wilton, which I call the Tomb of Carvilius, is set within view of Stonehenge. In 1722, my late Lord Pembroke, Earl Thomas, who was pleased to favor my inquiries at this place, opened a barrow in order to find the position of the body observed in these early days. He pitched upon one of those south of Stonehenge, close upon the road thither from Wilton, and on the east side of the road. Tis one of the double barrows, or where two are enclosed in one ditch. One of those, which I suppose the later kind, and of a fine-turned bell fashion, it may be seen in plate nine. On the west side, he made a section from the top to the bottom, an entire segment, from centre to circumference. The matter of composition of the barrel was good earth, quite through, except a coat of chalk about two foot thickness, covering it all over under the turf. Hence it appears that the method of making these barrows was to dig up the turf for a great space round, till the barrel was brought to its intended bulk. Then, with the chalk, dug out of the environing ditch, they powdered it all over, so that for a considerable time, these barrels must have looked white, even for some number of years. And the notion of sanctity annexed to them forbid people trampling on them, till perfectly settled and turfed over. Hence the neatness of their form to this day. At the top or centre of this barrel, not above three foot under the surface, my lord found the skeleton of the interred, perfect, of a reasonable size, the head lying towards Stonehenge, or northward. The year following, in order to prosecute this inquiry by my lord's order, I begun upon a barrow north of Stonehenge, in that group south of the Cursus. Tis one of the double barrows there, and the more easterly, and the lower of the two, likewise somewhat less. It was reasonable to believe this was a sepulchre of a man and his wife, that the lesser was the female, and so it proved, at least a daughter. We made a large cut at the top from east to west. After the turf taken off, we came to the layer of chalk, as before, then fine garden mould. About three foot below the surface, a layer of flints, humoring the convexity of the barrow. These flints are gathered from the surface of the downs in some places, especially where it has been ploughed. This being about a foot thick, rested on a layer of soft mould another foot, 
in which was enclosed an urn full of bones. This urn was of unbaked clay, of a dark reddish color, crumbled into pieces. It had been rudely wrought with small moldings round the verge, and other circular channels on the outside, with several indentures between, made with a pointed tool, as depicted in plate 32, where I have drawn all the sorts of things found in this barrow. The bones had been burnt, and crowded all together in a little heap, not so much as a hat crown would contain. The collarbone and one side of the underjaw are graved in their true magnitude. It appears to have been a girl of about fourteen years old, by their bulk, and the great quantity of female ornaments mixed with the bones, all which we gathered. Beads of all sorts and in great number, of glass of diverse colors, most yellow, one black. Many single, many in long pieces notched between, so as to resemble a string of beads, and these were generally of a blue color. There were many of amber, of all shapes and sizes, flat squares, long squares, round, oblong, little and great. Likewise many of earth, of different shapes, magnitude and color, some little and white, many large and flattish like a button, others like a pulley. But all had holes to run a string through, either through their diameter or sides. Many of the button sort seemed to have been covered with metal, there being a rim worked in them, wherein to turn the edge of the covering. One of these was covered with a thin film of pure gold. These were the young lady's ornaments, and all had undergone the fire, so that what would easily consume fell to pieces as soon as handled. Much of the amber burnt half through. This person was a heroine, for we found the head of a javelin in brass. At bottom are two holes for the pins that fastened it to the staff. Besides, there was a sharp bodkin, round on one end, square at the other, where it went into a handle. I still preserve whatever is permanent in these trinkets. But we recompose the ashes of the illustrious defunct, and cover them with earth, leaving visible marks at top of the barrel having been opened, to dissuade any other from disturbing them, and this was our practice in all the rest. Then we oped the next barrel to it, enclosed in the same ditch, which we supposed the husband or father of this lady. At fourteen inches deep, the mold being mixed with chalk, we came to the entire skeleton of a man, the skull and all the bones, exceedingly rotten and perished, through length of time, though this was a barrel of the latest sort, as we conjecture. The body lay north and south, the head to the north, as that Lord Pembroke opened. Next I went westward, to a group of barrels whence Stonehenge bears east-northeast. Here is a large barrow ditched about, but of an ancient make. On that side next Stonehenge are ten, lesser, small, and as it were, crowded together. South of the great one is another barrow, larger than those of the group, but not equaling the first. It would seem that a man and his wife were buried in the two larger, and that the rest were their children or dependents. One of the small ones, twenty cubits in diameter, I cut through, with a pit nine foot in diameter, to the surface of the natural chalk, in the center of the barrel, where was a little hole cut. A child's body, as it seems, had been burnt here, and covered up in that hole, but through the length of time consumed. From three foot deep we found much wood ashes, soft and black as ink, some little pieces of an urn, and black and red earth very rotten, some small lumps of earth red as vermilion, some flints burned through. Toward the bottom a great quantity of ashes and burnt bones. From this place I could count 128 barrows in sight. See a vast multiplicity of them. Tab 31. Going from hence more southerly, there is a circular dish-like cavity dug in the chalk, sixty cubits in diameter, like a barrow reversed. Tis near a great barrow, the least of the southwestern group. Tis between it and what I call the bush barrow, set with thorn trees. Tab 32. This cavity is seven foot deep in the middle, extremely well turned, and out of it, no doubt, the adjacent barrow is dug. The use of it seems to have been a place for sacrificing and feasting in memory of the dead, as was the ancient custom. Tis all overgrown with that pretty shrub, Erica vulgaris, now in flower and smelling like honey. We made a large cross-section in its center upon the cardinal points. We found nothing but a bit of red earthen pot. I dug up one of those I called druid's barrows, a small tump enclosed in a large circular ditch. I chose that next to a bush barrow, westward of it. Stonehenge bears hence northeast. We made a cross-section ten foot each way, three foot broad over its center, upon the cardinal points. 
At length we found a squarish hole cut into the solid chalk in the center of the tumulus. It was three foot and a half, that is, two cubits, long, and near two foot broad, that is, one cubit, pointing to Stonehenge directly. It was a cubit and a half deep from the surface. This was the Domus Exilis Flotonia, covered with artificial earth, not above a foot thick from the surface. In this little grave we found all the burnt bones of a man, but no signs of an urn. The bank of the circular ditch is on the outside, and is twelve cubits broad. The ditch is six cubits broad, the druid staff. The area is seventy cubits in diameter, the hole one hundred. I opened another of these of like dimensions, next to that Lord Pembroke first opened, south of Stonehenge. We found a burnt body in a hole in the chalk, as before. Mr. Roger Gale was with me. In some other barrows I opened were found large burnt bones of horses and dogs, along with humans. Also of other animals, it seemed, of fowl, hare, boars, deer, goats, or the like. And in a great and very flat old-fashioned barrow, west from Stonehenge, among other matters, I found bits of red and blue marble, chippings of the stones of the temple, so that probably the interred was one of the builders. Homer tells us of Achilles slaying horses and dogs at the funeral of his friend Patroclus. Lord Pembroke told me of a brass sword dug up from a barrow here, which was sent to Oxford. In that very old barrow, near Little Amesbury, was found a very large brass weapon of twenty pounds weight, like a pole-axe, said to be given to Colonel Wyndham. In the great long barrow furthest north from Stonehenge, which I call North Long Barrow, and supposed to be an archdruids, was found one of those brass instruments called celts, which I hold to belong to the druids, wherewith they cut off the mistletoe, as before mentioned. Mr. Stallard of Amesbury gave it to Lord Burlington, now in Sir Hans Sloane's cabinet, thirteen inches long. They dug a cell in a barrow east of Amesbury, and it was inhabited for some time. There they found all the bones of a horse. This is the sum of what is most material that fell within my observation relating to the barrows about Stonehenge. We find, evidently, these ancient nations had the custom of burning their dead bodies, probably before the name of Rome. So lacrimatories we read of in Scripture, ancienter than Greek or Roman times. Psalm 56, verse 8. End of chapter 10. Recording by Todd. Chapter 11 of Stonehenge, A Temple Restored to the British Druids. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Hand. Stonehenge, A Temple Restored to the British Druids by William Stukeley. Chapter 11 I have informed the reader to the best of my skill, what was and what is the state of Stonehenge, both above and below the ground. I apprehend it will be expected that I should say somewhat concerning the antiquity and time of erecting these works, especially of Stonehenge. But what can we say of a matter so very remote, where the oldest memoirs and reports of the oldest nation inhabiting the island can give us no satisfaction about it? but are as far to seek as to the founders of this wonderful work as we are at this time, and are forced to apply to magic in order to account for it. Notwithstanding, I shall endeavor to satisfy the reader's curiosity in this point as well as I can, by giving him my own opinion about it. Not doubting of his candor, in so arduous an attempt, which may perhaps be an amusement to him, whether it gains his belief or not. Therefore, I shall recite, in short, what occurs to me on this subject. 1. As to the antiquity of these temples in general. 2. Of the time of founding Stonehenge. The former will anticipate, in some sort, what I promised, in treating of the temples of the Druids in general. But I am naturally led to it here, by observing, that the name of the adjacent town of Ambersbury points out a relation to the work of Stonehenge, and to the ancient name of it. For as we took notice at first, the present name of Stonehenge is purely Saxon, given by our latest ancestors, by a people wholly strangers to the purport of the thing, that had no notion, no report of its having once been a sacred place, 
and signifies no more than hanging stones or a stone gallows the ancient britons called it quar guar which the monks latinized into coria gigantum the giant's dance a name suited to the marvellous notion they had of the structure or of the reports of magic concerned in raising it but i had rather choose to think quar guar in welsh truly means the great church the cathedral in our way of speaking a general title which the welsh inhabitants the remnants of the belge conquered by the romans gave it as well knowing the true use of it and even frequenting it in a religious way though they had driven off the first possessors of it and the builders i mean in divitiacus his time or sooner before the roman invasion there is a very plain reason that stonehenge was built before the wandsdyke was made and that was the last boundary of the belgic kingdom in britain the stones of which stonehenge is composed were fetched from beyond that boundary consequently then an enemy's country it seems not improbable that the wandsdyke was made when this belgic kingdom was at its height and that time we may well guess at from caesar he tells us in bel gaul lib two four the belge are of german original by force of arms they possessed themselves of the countries south of the rhine and towards the ocean driving out the gauls they were a very warlike nation and could produce one hundred thousand men in arms that one of their kings diviatacus in the memory of some then living obtained the government both of great part of gaul and in britain too i believe the belge and the sicambri all one people of german original our welsh call themselves simri and from them cumberland has its name it is very just to think this wandsdyke was made in the time of diviatacus both because of the greatness of the work suiting so potent a prince and because it is the last boundary after that time the roman power swallowing up all divisions i judge we may reasonably place the time of making the wandsdyke about fifty years before caesar wrote we may say a u c six fifty diviatacus probably ordered it to be made in person and it seems to have been drawn from the upper end of the tees river about whitchurch and andover in hampshire to the avon river about bristol these two rivers and the wandsdyke separated the belgic kingdom from the old celtic britons they by this means were driven from this beautiful country and from their stately temple of stonehenge by these powerful invaders it is remarkable enough that the inhabitants of somersetshire the ancient seat of belge retain still the belgic liquidating pronunciation v consonant for f z for s the devise is a town in the middle of the length of wandsdyke very probably erected among others to secure this ditch or fortification it seems to have been the capital fort or frontier town and to have its name from the king as a trophy or monument of his power built by him in person anonymous ravenna's may possibly call it punctiobici but we have no certainty that his copy retains the word uncorrupt or that he transcribed it right nor what alteration the romans made in the original word nor what was made in the later and barbarous times however there seems enough therein as well as in the present name of the town to countenance our conjecture the former part of the word punctuo which mr baxter thinks monstrous may come perhaps from the german word pugen which signifies an arduous work and might regard the castle here which is said to have been once the strongest in europe Newbrungenesis calls it devise they tell us legendary stories of its being built by an old british king devisus was probably the name of this belgic monarch or duiguis as gluguis king of demetia in wales wrote glissivius in toland page one eighty six and the termination may have been formed into latin from the celtic word teog dux whence perhaps the etruscan tages so much boasted of in their antiquities likewise the modern doge of venice so that diviaticus may well be divisus dux 
The name of the Wandsdyke I showed to be purely Celtic, page 4. It is an ancient Oriental custom to make these boundary ditches. Thus the land belonging to the several tribes of Israel was marked out by a ditch, as we read in the accounts of the Holy Land. Particularly the author of Les Voyages de la Terre Sainte, printed 1675, Paris, page 57, says, He traveled five or six miles along such a ditch, going from Joppa to Jerusalem, which parted the tribes of Benjamin and Judah. Tis recited, Joshua 15. The monkish writers make much ado about Aurelius Ambrosius, a Christian king of the Britons, in the time of our great ancestor Hengist, building Stonehenge, by the help of Merlin Ambrosius the magician, in memory of the British nobility slain treacherously by Hengist at Ambrosbury. Some say the fact was committed ad pegum ambri, others call it Cenobium ambrige, others ad montem ambrige. One, while they refer to the name Ambrosius, another time to an abbot Ambrius, and this was among our Roman British ancestors who were Christians. They add, too, that Merlin fetched these stones out of Ireland, that they had been brought before out of Africa into Ireland, that he set them up here in the same form by art magic, and that the stones were of medicinal virtue. These matters we read in Gerald Cambrin's De Amendrand, Hib C. 18, Higdon's Polychron, 5, Jeff, Monmouth, 8, Matt, Westminster, etc. This calls to my memory what the above-mentioned Dr. Harward informed me. He had heard the great Sir Christopher Wren say that there were such structures as Stonehenge in Africa, being temples dedicated to Saturn. But I need not be tedious in observing how absurd the monkish reports are of a Christian king erecting Stonehenge as a sepulchral monument for the British nobility, massacred in the monastery of Ambrosbury. At the same time, they say, their bodies were buried in the churchyard of the monastery. Nor how they confound the names of Ambrosius the king, Ambrius the abbot, the town, abbey, and mountain of Ambry, and perhaps of Merlin too, for one of them was called Ambrosius. But their affirming the edifice came out of Africa into Spain, thence into Ireland, thence into Britain, and of its being erected here in the same form by art magic, and that the stones are of a medicinal virtue, these notions lead us to the original truth of the Druid founders, and that Stonehenge had originally the name of Ambrus, and from it the adjacent town of Ambrusbury had its name. To pursue this matter a little further, between Stonehenge and the town, hanging over the river, upon elevated ground, is a fine and ancient camp, commonly called Vespasian's, and not without much probability attributed to him. We have often had occasion to mention it before. That great man, destined by providence for executing his final vengeance on the people of the Jews, and thereby accomplishing our Saviour's predictions, by his successes in this place, paved a road to the imperial dignity. Having conquered the Isle of Wight, he pursued his good fortune higher up into this country, where he made this camp, and another across the heath, called Yanesbury, which seems to retain the latter part of his name. The camp we are speaking of near Ambrosbury is an oblong square, nicely placed upon a flexure of the river, which closes one side and one end of it. There is an old barrow enclosed in it, which, doubtless was one of these belonging to this plain, and to the temple of Stonehenge, before this camp was made. It is pretty to observe that the road from Stonehenge to Ambrosbury runs upon the true via praetoria of the camp. The general's tent, or praetorium, was in that part south of the road, between it and the river, toward little Ambrosbury. There is another gate of the camp, at the lower end, northward, the Porta Praetoria Ordinaria, in the Roman language. Now I apprehend that Stonehenge was originally called the Ambras, from thence this camp was called Ambrusburg, and thence the name of the town underneath. Mr. Camden writes that near Pensans in Cornwall is a very remarkable stone, called Main Ambra, which though it be of a vast bigness, yet you may move it with one finger, notwithstanding the great number of men cannot remove it from its place. The name is interpreted the Stone of Ambrosius. A picture of it in Norden's History of Cornwall, page 48, 
I have seen one of these rocking stones, as called commonly in Derbyshire. Mr. Toland, in his History of the Druids, mentions it too, and says there are such in Wales and in Ireland. Sir Robert Sibbald mentions them in Scotland, all rightly judged to have been done by the Druids. Sir Robert, speaking of the rocking stone near Balverde, or the Bard's Town, in Fife, I am informed, says he, that this stone was broken by the usurper Cromwell's soldiers, and it was discovered then that its motion was performed by a yoke exuberant in the middle of the under surface of the uppermost stone, which was inserted in a cavity in the surface of the lower stone. This is the artifice of the stones at Stonehenge, but applied here by the Druids for a movable principle, as there for stability. I call them mortaise and tenon, and before observed them to be of an egg-like form, which Sir Robert calls a yoke. The main amber in Cornwall was likewise destroyed in the civil wars by one of Oliver's governors. These reformers had a notion of these works being superstitious matters. Main ambry is lapis ambrosius, or petra ambrosia, and that name leads us to consider the famous petre ambrosia on the coins of the city of Tyre, a specimen of them I have drawn on the plate following. These and many more of the like sort struck by the city of Tyre and other of their founder Hercules may be seen in Valiant's second volume of Colony Coins, pages 69, 148, 218, 251, 337. They represent two great rough stones called Petre Ambrosiae, with an altar before them and an olive tree. Hercules, the hero of Tyre, the famous navigator of antiquity, their founder, sacrificing. On some of the coins, Petre Ambrosiae wrote in Greek. He is represented indeed like the Greek Hercules, but in the latter times of the Roman Empire, when these coins were struck, they at Tyre were as far to seek about the true meaning and origin of their first antiquities as we of ours. And what knowledge they had of them was from legendary reports of the Greeks, who chiefly, among the heathens, had the knack of writing. These reports, as we may find in Nonus, his Dionysics, 40 and 41, acquaint us that Hercules invented shipping as a Latin poet to intimates, Tibullus. Prima ratum ventis credere docta tirus. They acquaint us that he ordered Tyre to be built, where the Petre Ambrosiae stood, which were two movable rocks standing by an olive tree. He was to sacrifice on them, and they should become fixed and stable. Rather, the city should be built with a happy auspice and become permanent. Here are our main ombres, made artfully movable, a kind of altars or pillars, the same as the pillars of Hercules, so famed and as little understood. They were the original patriarchal altars for libations and sacrifices, and mean in general their altars, whether movable or immovable, or as we may speak, their temples, which imply an altar properly, enclosed with stones and a ditch, or ground dedicated and set apart for public celebration of religious rites. For the word ambrosius means in general, consecrated, dedicated to religious use. Beside the Petre Ambrosiae of Tyre and our main ombres of Britain and Ireland, we meet with another in Hyptasian's History 3.3. 3. Speaking of Hercules, he mentions the Gigonian stone, as he calls it, near the ocean, which may be moved with the stalk of an asphodel, but can't be removed by any force. It seems this word, Gigonius, is purely Celtic, for Gwynog signifies Motians the rocking stone, and Gwigon is what the boys with us call a gig or little top, for these Gigonian stones are of that shape, pyramidal. No wonder these matters are well-nigh lost in the mist of extreme antiquity, when even the meaning of the word ambrosius was hardly known, either to the ancients or moderns, till Mr. Baxter discovered it in his glossary. It signifies oil of roses, rosaceum, the most ancient kind of perfume. In the fourth Odyssey, 5.445, Edothea, a sea goddess, teaches Melanus and his companions to cure the odious smell of the sea calves.
Amvrosin Iporina Akastothika Farusa Iladi Mala Penusan. She put ambrosia to their noses, sweetly smelling. Again, in his hymn to Venus, the graces washed the goddess and anointed her with oil ambrosial, such as becomes the immortals. Rodoente de Crien Alayo Ambrosio, which is a tautology. For from a length of time they scarce knew the true meaning of the word in Homer's age. Virgil seems to understand but somewhat of the original meaning of the word, speaking of Venus, her hair was anointed with ointment perfumed. Ambrosique come divunum vertici odorem spiravere, Aeneid. In Pliny, Natural History 8, 1, we find the oleum rodinum, most ancient, common, and simple. And this is the true ambrosia, which from its very ancient use in sacred rites had almost lost its meaning, and was used to signify, one while the food of the gods, another time immortality, again whatever is divine or appropriate to the gods. But simply, it signifies oil of roses, still from its first use in sacred matters, it imports anointed, in a religious sense, consecrated, dedicated. Then main ombres, ombres, petra, ambrosia, signify the stones anointed with holy oil, consecrated, or in a general sense a temple, altar, or place of worship. The truth is, it was a patriarchal custom to consecrate their altars, pillars, or in a general word, temples, by anointing with oil, either simple or perfumed. Rose oil being the oldest engrossed the general name of the action, so that a stone anointed with oil of roses is a main amber, or lapis ambrosius, the same as an altar or stone dedicated to religious use. The plural number, petre ambrosiae, import a church or temple in our way of speaking. We have an illustrious instance of this practice in the Holy Scriptures, and the earliest, Genesis 28. This is not commonly understood by writers. Tis the moving and memorable history of young Jacob, sent away from his father's house alone to take a long journey to some unknown relations. He came to a place, called afterward Bethel, and sleeping with his head on a stone for a pillow, had a celestial vision, and a promise from God of the highest importance to him and all mankind. Awaking, he thought the place had been holy ground, where perhaps his grandfather Abraham had before time built an altar a house of God, or gate of heaven, as he elegantly names it. Therefore he rose up early in the morning, which was one circumstance, in patriarchal times, of the work he was going about, and took the stone that he had put for his pillow, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it, and called the place Beth-el, i.e., the house of God. Then he vowed that if God would please to prosper him in his journey, and bring him back into his own country, he would build a temple there, and consecrate to God the tithe of his substance, as was the manner in those times. This is in reality a votive, patriarchal temple, altar or house of God, which he not only vows to build, but at the same time endows it. The stone which Jacob anointed was not an altar properly, lying on the ground whereon to make a libation, but he set it up as a pillar. It was one of the upright stones, which the scripture calls pillars, as standing of itself, a part of a circle of stones enclosing the altar. And by the act of anointing, Jacob consecrated it, as the matter then was, destined it for a sacred purpose, as an earnest of his will in good time to fulfill it. And this he did fulfill in chapter 35, building the celebrated temple of Bethel. Here Jeroboam set up one of his golden calves. At last it was destroyed by Vespasian. In Exodus 29.4, we have an instance of Moses rising up early in the morning and building an altar and setting up twelve pillars around it. This was before the tabernacle was made, which introduced the custom of covered temples. But so famous was that patriarchal temple of Jacob's, which he built at Bethel, that the heathen called all their temples of that sort when they were perverted to idolatrous purposes, Bethalia, Lapides, Betali, and the like, which indeed is but another manner of expressing Lapis Ambrosius, or our main amber. 
and according to the custom the fabulous greeks having lost the true history of its origin affixed many strange stories to it as of saturn devouring such a stone wrapped up in a skin instead of his son jupiter which seems to be formed from the memory of praying at these places in the name of the meditorial deity as the patriarchs did and Senconathion tells us the god oranus devised battalia or animated stones he means our rocking stones gigonian stones i shall show in my discourse on that subject the by oranus he means righteous noah who according to the patriarchal usage built an altar unto jehovah genesis chapter eight verse twenty meaning one of these patriarchal temples in time by the corruption of mankind these places were desecrated to idolatrous purposes and writers pervert the intent of them so that god almighty raising up the mosaic dispensation was obliged to interdict the very use and practice of these open temples and introduce the covered one of the tabernacle by way of opposition to heathenism as well as with other important views we find now the meaning of anointed stones in antiquity and the olive tree set by the stones on the tyrian coins as the very learned author of archaeologia gracia observes on the affair of consecration they were more or less sumptuous and expensive as other parts of divine worship according to the ability of the worshippers young jacob a traveller used plain oil part of his viaticum others used perfumed oil or ambrosia that author cites us from athenaeus the method of consecrating jupiter setia's statue with a libation called ambrosia and others by anointing with oil prayers and libations exodus thirty two twenty two we have the holy precious ointments made under the jewish dispensation for the like purpose and we use such for inaugurations of our kings to this day the tyrian hercules who built tyre and set up the petre ambrosia in these coins if i mistake not lived as early as the time of jacob's anointing the stone at bethel the great bocart who penetrated very deep into the phoenician learning looks upon it as a clear matter that in joshua's time the phoenicians sent innumerable colonies into the mediterranean coasts and even to the ocean in the preface to his admirable work canaan he says he has a great suspicion that colonies went abroad this way before that time particularly he asserts that hercules in eusebius surnamed de Sanaus, who was famous in phoenicia before the exodus is the same who conquered antaeus in africa which in eusebius is set fifty-six years before he is called hercules primus and that is sixty-three years before the exodus in eusebius's chronology again he judges it to be two thousand years distance between the later roman times and the first hercules now from constantine the great two thousand years carries us up to jacob's time and he proves from aristotle de mirabilibus that hercules built utica and africa at that time wherein eusebius says he was famous in phoenicia and this must be when hercules was old he having conquered antaeus in that country when he was young but i find in the same eusebius prometheus is set one hundred eleven years still earlier before the first mention of hercules this is during the life of the patriarch joseph prometheus and atlas were brothers and students in astronomy with whom the story of hercules is always conjoined and so high at least i must place the time of our tyrian hercules who is the same as de Sanos. but Mirianus, transcribing eusebius calls him docenus and hesychius says dorsans is a name of hercules with the indians but by the indians it is likely the phoenicians and arabians are meant for the ancient greeks call all the country to the east of the mediterranean sea india and then we may in some measure understand the report of Ammonanus marcellinus who takes it from timogenes an old greek historian but a syrian by nation speaking concerning the peopling of gaul that the more ancient hercules conducted the dorianes to the countries bordering on the ocean perhaps the dosarani are meant an arabian nation mentioned by ptolemy a deity of the arabians was called dosaris or dosaris mentioned by step bizant 
Suidas, and Tertullian. A difficult word which Bocart cannot trace from the Arabian language, nor is it easy to say what deity he was. No wonder such matters are obscured through so long distance of time. Some think him Bacchus, some Mars, and why not Hercules? For after mankind lapsed into idolatry, these three were much confounded. I find sufficient testimony of the Tyrian Hercules coming from Arabia, about the Red Sea, or having companions that were natives of that country. For this reason they named an island at the city of Gaddis, which they built, Erythia, Erythiae, which Pliny 4.22 says was so called from the first possessors, the Tyrians, who came from the Rithian Sea, which is the Red Sea. So Linus says the same. That sea had its name from Erathus, as the Greeks and the same Pliny write, who is Edom or Esau, brother of Jacob. The words are synonymous, signifying red. The reports of Hercules's expedition to that island Erythia, now Cadiz, is famous in all the old Greek writers. This relation we have given of the Tyrian Hercules, that he lived about the time of Abraham, or soon after, according to Eusebius's chronology, that he came from about the Red Sea, and had companions in his travels that lived thereabouts, is much confirmed by what Josephus writes from Alexander Polyhistor, who cites it from a very ancient author called Clodemus, surnamed Malchus, who wrote a history of the Jews agreeable with the Mosaic. He says, Abraham had several sons by Keturah. He names Apher, Surus, and Japhra. That Apher and Japhra were auxiliaries to Hercules when he fought in Libya against Antaeus. That from Apher the country was named Africa. That Hercules married his daughter and begat of her Dodorus. Josephus, in the same chapter of the first book of his Antiquities, writes that Abraham had six sons born of Keturah men heroic and wise, that they and their posterity were settled in Troglodytus, in the country of Arabia Felix, reaching to the Red Sea. He makes Ophir, or Apher, grandson to Abraham by Midian, his son, that Apher waged war in Libya and conquered it, and placed his sons there, who called the country Africa from their father. So Schindler, in his lexicon, page 1361. Making proper allowance for relations of such very ancient matters, transmitted by historians of different countries, different languages, and so often transcribed and translated, before they came down to us, here is enough to confirm and explain what we have before advanced, both as to the time and place and matter. And we cannot but see what relation our main ombres and the Gigonian stone by the ocean have to the Petre Ambrosia, which Hercules set up at Tyre, which is the drift of my discourse. That very Gigonian stone, for aught I see, may be our rocking stone near Pensans. It stands by the seaside. Nor do I see any absurdity if we judge that it was erected there by Hercules in person. Near it is to that other famous Druid temple called Biscawoon, consisting of 19 pillars in a circle and a central kebla. The entrance is made of two somewhat larger stones than the rest, not improbably one of the Herculean labors. It is affirmed by the best authors that our Tyrian Hercules, the more ancienter Hercules, built the city of Gaddis at Cadiz now. And wherever Hercules came, there we read of his pillars. Thus, Avenius. Hic gaber herbs est dicta tartessus prius, hic sunt columnae pertinacis Hercules. Arian, too, of the life of Alexander remarks that Gaddis was built by the Phoenicians. There was a temple of Hercules. The form, the sacrifices, and ceremonies there performed are all after the Phoenician manner. Strabo, in his Lieb three, says there were two pillars in this temple dedicated to Hercules, which the learned Tristan in his Commentaries on Metals, page 384, says he doubts not, but they were Petre and Brogier, in imitation of those of the same name in the temple of Hercules, of Tyre, 
which Herodotus in Euterpe speaks of. He appears to have been an extraordinary genius and a man of great piety withal. Therefore, wherever he came, he made these patriarchal temples, or set up pillars of stone, as antiquity called them, just as the patriarchal family did in the land of Canaan. And Hercules seems to me to have been a great man, raised up by providence, to carry the reformed patriarchal religion to the extremest part of the then known Western world. Here, I suppose, the religion of Abraham remained pure for many ages under the Druids, till perhaps corrupted by incursions from the continent. It is remarkable that the Romans, who were so Catholic, different from those we now absurdly call Roman Catholics, as to permit all religions, persecuted only that of the Druids and the Christian, whence we are naturally led to think there was a good deal of resemblance. Indeed, the Druids were accused of human sacrifices. They crucified a man and burnt him on the altar, which seems to be a most extravagant act of superstition derived from some extraordinary notices they had of mankind's redemption, and perhaps from Abraham's example misunderstood. But as to human sacrifices simply considered, the Romans themselves and all other nations upon earth at times practiced them. To this, Hercules, antiquity affixed very many names from different notions of him, retained in different countries, and after idolatry took root, he was worshipped under those names of consecration according to the old method. For instance, one of his names was Palamon. Palamon, says Hesychius, is Hercules. The Greeks made him a sea deity, who had been so great a sea captain. They called him Melicerta, which is his Phoenician name Melicartus, king of the city. Ovid tells us the story in Met for Nomnus calls him Astrochiton, starry robed, from his being made a constellation in heaven. In the Gallic picture of him, which Lucian saw, he is represented with a spear in one hand under the name of Ogmius. Mr. Toland, in his history of the Druids, shows us the true interpretation of that word from the Irish language, after the learned had in vain attempted the explication of it. From thence we infer he brought the use of letters hither. Caesar informs us the Druids had them. He is called Assis by the Easterns, which signifies the valiant, the same as Jesus of the Germans. Beside the patriarchal custom of building these places of worship and consecrating them with oil, we find many other footsteps of that most ancient religion in the history of Hercules. Silius, speaking of the strange rites used in the Gatian Temple of Hercules, says the priests officiated there barefooted, practiced chastity, had no statues, used white linen surplices. And it is a notorious custom with the ancient Phoenicians to pay tithe. Indeed, they paid tithe to Hercules, which only imports that it was a precept and practice introduced by Hercules. And after they had deified Hercules, they practiced it toward him. This was a common method when idolatry began. I shall treat more largely of these affairs when I discourse expressly of the patriarchal religion. Likewise, I shall prove more fully from chronological characters that this Hercules lived at the time we are speaking of, in the canon Mosaica Chronologia. What I now recite concerning these matters I could not well avoid, as they, in my apprehension, relate to the name of Stonehenge. Pliny Natural History 756 gives us a testimony of our Hercules, under the name of Melkartus, as Bocart rightly corrects it, first bringing tin into Greece from the Cassiterid Islands, by which the British are meant. The tin of Tyre, which the merchants of Greece came to buy at the fairs of that city, is mentioned Ezekiel 27.12, which no doubt came from hence. But it is much earlier mentioned among lead and other metals, when the Midianites had it in Moses' time, Numbers 31.22. The Chaldee and Arabic version there use the word kastira, the Hiriosolimitan kastira. No wonder the Midianites should then abound with tin, when we were told by Josephus that Ephor, son of Midian, was one of Hercules' companions. The seventy in that passage of Numbers call it kasiteros. But tin is mentioned earlier still in Job 19.24, and Job lived in this same country on the borders of Arabia. 
it is very evident from bocart that the phoenicians had sailed quite round britain by what he writes of thule how then can we doubt but the great island which they found in the extremest west was britain but they kept their gainful navigation hither so secret for many centuries that even herodotus the earliest greek writer professes he knows not whence the tin comes britain was the only country where it could come from in any quantity as pliny says but from this great secrecy of the phoenicians we have lost the high antiquities of britain as unknown to the greeks the only heathen nation that had the address to commit things to writing therefore we must be content with what small remains of this kind can be fished out of the wreck of time by such conjectural methods as antiquaries cannot avoid insisting on in devonshire is hartland point so called corruptly as the excellent camden observes for hercules promontorium and upon the durham sea coast is a town on a promontory called hartlepool a village called hart near it i take it to have been called by the greek traders here heracleopolis and hence probably came that fine old altar in greek dedicated to the tyrian hercules which mr roger gale and i copied in corbridge churchyard from these and many other considerations of this kind which i shall hereafter treat of more largely and professedly i cannot but join in opinion with franc philifus in his epistles and lilius geraldus in his hercules mentioned by mr camden in the last quoted passage and with many other writers that the very ancient phoenician or tyrian hercules conducted an eastern colony hither upon the aborigines with whom came the druids the builders of stonehenge and the like works among us and let this suffice for what i promised upon the first head of this chapter viz to speak of the antiquity of these works in general two we are to speak of the time of founding stonehenge end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of stonehenge a temple restored to the british druids this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by kristen hand stonehenge a temple restored to the british druids by william stukeley chapter twelve in my inquiries into these works of the ancient druids in our island i observed a greater exactness in placing them with regard to the quarters of the heavens than one would expect in works seemingly so rude and in so remote an age to which we must necessarily refer them but more particularly moved my attention was a certain variation from cardinal points which i observed regular and uniform in the works of one place and that variation was different in works of another place yet equally regular and uniform in that place suppose for instance the works about abury in wiltshire generally vary nine or ten degrees to the left hand from cardinal points i e westward from the north and the works at stonehenge generally vary to the right hand from cardinal points and that to the quantity of six or seven degrees the principal diameter or ground line of stonehenge leading from the entrance up the middle of the temple to the high altar from which line the whole work is formed varies about that quantity southward of the northeast point the intent of the founders of stonehenge was to set the entrance full northeast being the point where the sun rises or nearly at the summer solstice as well because that is the farthest elongation of the great celestial luminary northward the complement of our earth felicity in ripening the fruits of the earth as because then they celebrated one of their principal religious meetings or festivals with sacrifices public games and the like such was the custom of all the ancient nations the isthmian nemesian olympian pythian games famous in the works of the learned nations those of tyre two maccabees four eighteen dedicated to their and our founder the ancient tyrian hercules who i suppose conducted the first phoenician colony with our druids into britain these were all held at this time of the year 
a custom continued from patriarchal times. This exactness with which the Druids set their works, and the uniformity of their variation, make me believe this variation was not the effect of chance or negligence. By a superficial reflection upon it, we should be apt to suspect it was owing to their observing the sun's rising on the longest day of the year, or summer solstice, and setting their line by it. For this is supposed to be a method by which they formerly set our churches, marking the sun's rising at the equinox. But the Druids were too good astronomers and mathematicians to need so mean an artifice. Nor does it correspond to the quantity precisely enough. Besides, this same variation appears where it cannot possibly regard the sun's rising at that time. For I observed, like the variation, or very near, in all the other parts relating to this temple before taken notice of, beside the avenue leading up to the temple from the northeast, in a straight line, which has the before-mentioned variation all the way. At the bottom of the hill, this avenue divides into two wings, each going off from the last mentioned part with a decent sweep, the one to the left hand westward, the other to the right hand eastward. They go off with a like angle, and that angle varies the like quantity. The western wing goes to the cursus, before observed, the place upon the downs, half a mile off Stonehenge, made for races with chariots and horses. The right hand wing of the avenue runs directly eastward for a mile together, pointing to a place on an angle of the river called Radfin. This part of the avenue, which was intended by the founders to have been drawn precisely east and west, varies about five or six degrees to the south. Likewise, that great work of the cursus itself, which stretches its length across the downs from east to west, like a line of latitude upon the globe, varies such a like quantity from true east and west the same way. The meridian line of Stonehenge passes exactly through the middle of this cursus. Further, at the end of this cursus, the huge bank of earth, above 200 feet long, made across the end of the cursus as a meta, and whereon sat the princes and judges of the prizes, this bank of earth is drawn exactly at a right angle with the cursus, consequently due north and south, but with the variation before spoken of. These and other like observations here, as well as in other Druid works, appeared to be no otherwise to be accounted for, but that the Druids used a magnetical compass in laying down the works, and that the needle varied so much at that time from the true meridian line. I remembered I opened this affair nearly twenty years ago to Dr. Halley, who was of the same sentiment. Nor am I the first who suspected the Phoenicians of old were possessed of this great secret, as well as the Chinese, from times immemorial. I am not moved to think otherwise by what Bogart writes against it. The very name of the magnet Lapis Heracleus strongly suggests the Tyrian navigator before mentioned knew of it, as is well argued by Fuller in his Miscellanies 4.19 and many things occur in the mythology of the ancients wherein if i mistake not i discern most evident traces of this knowledge of the directive power of the magnet we are not to despise the fables of the ancients but to make the best use of them and search out for their latent truths my predecessor cumberland observes in sankanathathon page 325 that apollodorus for instance hath many truths in his mythic history derived from the tradition of phoenicians and egyptians planting athens and the greeks those happy practitioners in writing as well as other arts took the unlikely turn of the marvellous to so exorbitant a degree as to write nothing about it in apollodorus put out by the learned dr gale page one hundred fourteen we have an account of the tenth labor of hercules his conquest of Cadiz, or Gadira, as then called, or Erythea. We are told the hero set up the two pillars at the strait's mouth at Gibraltar, or then Tartessus, which we may reasonably suppose some temple made of these rough stones, or some main ombres, like those we mentioned before, the Petra Ambrosia in the Tyrian coins. 
then says our author going on his journey the rays of the sun were so vehement upon him that he had the boldness to draw his bow against him the god admiring the intrepidity of the man gave him a golden cup with which he sailed over the ocean pisander in his second book in athenius dipnos eleven writes the same only that oceanus lent him the cup pineasus in his first of the history of hercules says he begged it of nereus son of sol and with it sailed to eurythia macromb saturn twenty one five theoclitus in athenaeus aforesaid in his second de tempest mentions the same thing he said it before in his titanomachia pharisees in his third of history quoted both in athenaeus and macrobius tells a story somewhat like that of apollodorus but more particular servius ain seven mentions it but as some of the former makes the cup of brass instead of gold alexander ephesius the like all very ancient writers lucian says that hercules sailed in a sea conch shell what can we understand by all this mentioned by so many grave authors but a compass box which enabled him to sail the great ocean and penetrate to our northern island less obnoxious to the sun's vehement heat add to this in the same place apollodorus speaks of his fighting albion and dercinus by mela called bergion sons of neptune which were the most ancient names of the britannic isles before the name of britain diodorus siculus in his fourth book delivers a like account of this tenth labor of hercules but in a mere historical manner and adds that when he returned by sicily he dedicated a grove to geryon the hero where to his time the people did religious rites for this affair of sacred groves we know our druids were famous he built a temple likewise at gades we are not to suppose it a covered edifice like what posterity called a temple but an open one according to the mode of those days covered temples at the time being a thing unknown in the world afterward a magnificent temple properly was there built to him mello witnesses that it was our egyptian hercules who was there worshipped for i suppose our egyptian and the tyrian hercules to be all one the same mentioned by the name of assis in mainthon's seventeenth dynasty in josephus circa ap in africanus eusebius and Cincellus apollonius two fourteen writes it was not the theban but the egyptian hercules that came to gates which is confirmed by hectius and herodotus in euterpe says hercules is a very ancient deity among the egyptians not so among the greeks and i suppose this hero lived at or very near the time of the patriarch abraham these were the times about the beginning of idolatry and hercules was far from being an idolater himself though worshipped afterwards for his great exploits and perhaps on this very account of his inventing or knowing the use of the compass this is the hercules kneeling on one knee a constellation in heaven taken notice of by dionysus haliacarn by setses hyginus aeschylus and others it seems to indicate his piety for which the astronomers his disciples placed him in the heavens he kneels upon the arctic circle and supports the zodiac on his shoulders though this is not understood by the painting on our modern globes the phoenicians his successors in the tin trade of britain kept the trade in the very name of the island as a great secret as well as the use of the compass till it was lost with them but it seems highly probable because lucian describes hercules with a sphere in his hand that he affixed the present asterisms of the zodiac and his successors the phoenicians propagated them tis next to our present purpose to consider that famous oracle of jupiter ammon in africa to be referred to the most early times of idolatry rendered illustrious by alexander the great taking a journey to it which gives us the opportunity of knowing somewhat of it quam vis 
Ethiopium populis, Arabunc, Beatis gentibus ac indis, Unus sit Jupiter amnon. Lucan. All these nations, with Egypt and Africa, were peopled by the posterity chiefly of Ham. They were the first that fell into idolatry and worshipped their common progenitor, called Amanus, in Sankanathion. Hecatus says Amun, as the Egyptians write it, is the word of those that invoke God, and that they meant somewhat very mysterious by it. The history of its origin is this. Bacchus, the hero, or demigod, traveling through the sandy deserts of Africa with a great army, was perishing with thirst. He prayed to his father Jupiter for relief, who sent a ram that showed him a spring, saved him and his host. Out of gratitude, the hero builds a temple there to the deity who thus aided him under the form of a ram. There is no room to doubt that this is in part copied from the transaction of the children of Israel in the Arabian wilderness. They have added to it a name and notion borrowed from patriarchal tradition of a divine person symbolized by a ram, horned, anointed, which is all one. We Christians mean Messiah. Innumerable passages in old authors which I might cite, innumerable monuments of antiquity and sculpture show that Jupiter Ammon was figured as a ram, with a ram's head, with ram's horns. They applied the patriarchal notion of the Messiah to their progenitor Ham, in an idolatrous way, and deified him under that character. There is a very remarkable passage in Herodotus, which it is worth our while to transcribe. In Euterp, Cap. 42, that author tells us why the Theban Egyptians pay so great a regard to the sheep. Hercules, on his importunity to Jupiter, that he might have the honor personally to see him, at length prevailed, and the god consented to exhibit himself to his view under this device. Vis, Jupiter cut off a ram's head, put the skin over his own head, and thus appeared to Hercules. Whence the Egyptians made the statue of Jupiter with a ram's head, and called Jupiter Amamun. Whence they hold sheep for sacred animals, never kill them but once a year upon the festival day of Jupiter, when only one ram is sacrificed and his head put upon the statue of Jupiter, all that are there present beat the ram, and at last he is buried in a sacred urn. It is not impossible to see that this is derived from that history recorded, Exodus 33. Moses desires of Jehovah repeatedly that he might see them. He calls it seeing his glory. He has answered at length, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of Jehovah before thee. Thou canst not see my face, but I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and cover thee with my hand, whilst I pass by. Thou shalt see my back parts only. Here he notoriously promises Moses that he shall see him in a symbolical form. In the next chapter, Jehovah descended in the luminous cloud, or Shekinah, and proclaimed the name of Jehovah, recites those attributes that relate to his dealings with mankind in the strongest point of light, his goodness and mercy and long-suffering, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, but adds he will by no means clear the guilty, but visit the father's iniquity upon the children. Wherein our original and fatal transgression is sufficiently intimated, and that God's justice is equal to his mercy, and the necessity of a divine redemption by sacrifice, which in scripture language is called the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All this the most ancient nations had a knowledge of from patriarchal tradition. When they lapsed into idolatry, they applied these good notions to their new idolatry and made statues from the symbolical and figurative forms of speech used in true religion. They are sacrificing the ram on the festival day of Jupiter. They are beating the ram, putting his head on the statue of their deity, burying him in a sacred urn, all most evidently pointing out the notions they had in the most early times of the suffering state of the Messiah. And such was the origin, in short, of Jupiter Ammon. But it appears, by what learned authors wrote, on Curtius's description of his statue, that a magnetical compass box made one considerable part of his sacreds. This we read in Hyde, Purse Religious, page 495, in Curtius, published by Pitiscus, and by Rader, the Jesuit, 
and Scotus in Ortelius by Fuller, Hewart, and others. This compass box with the statue of the deity was set in a golden ship, the golden cup of Hercules, and carried in procession on the shoulders of the priest, accompanied by women singing an hymn in their own language. I doubt not, but the circumstance of carrying this golden ship on the shoulders of the priests is an imitation of the Mosaic Ark in the march of the Israelites through the wilderness during their forty years' pilgrimage. Though they mistook the reason of the thing, the Jewish church then being in a military and traveling state. But where the camp rested, the ark was reposited in the eighty tomb of the tabernacle. So likewise, when in possession of the land of Canaan, this is sufficient proof that the Libyans herein copied after the Israelites, not vice versa, as our moderns are willing to think in these cases. Curtius tells us the habit of Ammon's statue was made of smaragd and other precious stones wrought in mosaic work which I take to be two in imitation of the pontifical attire under Moses's administration, particularly of the sacred oracular pectoral made of mosaic work with gems. I apprehend that beside the statue of Ammon, there was a figure of the upper part, at least of a ram on the compass box, which was the Oracle. And it is easy to guess how this may be managed for the purpose, even beyond the trick of Januarius's blood and other popish devices. Hence, we may better understand the famous golden fleece, which occasioned the Argonautic expedition, one of the earliest and most memorable eras of the Grecian history. If we suppose this golden fleece to be a compass box, we see the reason why the choice youth of Greece set out upon that voyage, which, as all other matters of ancient history among the Greeks, is so unaccountably puffed up with the leaven of fable. It became navigators to run any hazard for such a treasure. If we inquire into its origin, it is thus. Phyrxus, son of Athamas, and Nephiles, according to the Greeks, had a ship given him by his mother. The ship is called in the fable a golden ram, or the ram with a golden fleece, the same thing as Hercules' golden cup. In this, he and his sister Hella, flying the ill usage of their mother-in-law Eno, sail away by sea. Hella, affrighted in the voyage, falls overboard and gives name to the Hellespont. Phrixus continues the voyage and goes to Aetes, king of Colchis, where he hangs up his golden ram in the temple, to Jupiter Phyxius. One would be apt to imagine they meant Pyxius, alluding to the box. Jason made his far-famed expedition thither afterward and stole it but the ram was placed in the heavens among the constellations as a memorial, the first sign in the zodiac which shows the high antiquity of the story. This account manifestly pretends very great antiquity and some signal event. I observe this Eno, their mother-in-law, is said to be the nurse of Bacchus, and throwing herself with her son Melisert into the sea, became a goddess under the name of Leucothea. Her son became a god under the name of Palaemon. This Melisert is allowed by all the learned to be known other than our Melicartus above mentioned. Polamion is Hercules, says Hesychius. Polamion is his name of deification. Pausanias, in the beginning of his Corinthica, informs us the apotheosis of Eno and Melicerta was the occasion of founding the famous Isthmian Games. Plutarch says the same, and... Fivorinus. Again, I observe, Phrixus is said to be the son of Nephili, a cloud, whence called Nubigena by Columella. We must hence expect somewhat very secret and obscure. Further, all writers say openly this ram or ship of Phrixus was oracular and could speak upon occasion. So all the writers of the Argonautics too will have the ship Argos to be loquacious and oracular. Magnus, Another name of the lodestone is often called Adamus, which seems to be no other than Athamas. Apollodorus makes Magnus the son of Aeolus, who, marrying Nace, inhabited the isle Seraphus. Aeolus was a great sailor, invented sails, and studied the winds, therefore deified and made the god of the winds. 
I suppose it all ends in the mysterious envelopment of the knowledge of the magnetic compass. I hope for the reader's candor in reciting thus much from ancient fable, which I did as concisely as possible. But in matters of obscure antiquity, we must make use of all helps, and in heathen antiquity, we have no other. A strictly historical way of writing in former times is only to be expected in the sacred canon of the Jews, and what is remarkable, after God's Holy Spirit had deserted them, their writers became the greatest fablers in the world, and, if possible, outdid the Greeks in that way. One would imagine the fashion of these most ancient charts was to divide the circle into twelve parts and affix the celestial signs of the zodiac to them, beginning with the east at Aries, where the sun rises at the equinoxes, and thence they might call the box by the name of Aries, as showing the east where Aries is placed. As now the Turks and Arabians call it Kibla Noma, i.e. showing the Kibla, or south point, the way toward which they turn their faces in devotion. So we only inquire for the north point, and call it the lodestone, because it shows the load star or north pole. But tis all one, any one point in a circle being found, the rest are found too. From what has been said, it seems probable that the fable of the hero finding out the spring in the sandy deserts of Africa, by the help of a ram sent from Jupiter, means the traveling over those immense plains by the help of a compass, which they called by the name of a ram or a golden ram and that the possessors of the ancient oracle of Ammon had such a secret, which they cunningly applied to the sacreds of their deity. Probably in that most early age they had not improved the use of it to the pitch and manner that we enjoy, with a needle, and that set upon a central pin, but having found out the veracity of the magnet, they put it into a boat which was to swim on water. Therein it would have the liberty to turn itself to its proper n degrees, 278. This boat was the better a handle for the mythologist to call Hercules' vessel a golden cup, because cups were made in the shape of a boat and had the same denomination, symbium. Those learned commentators upon Curtius above mentioned agree there was a stone along with the statue of Ammon, carried about in the golden ship, and perhaps hence the ancient navigators took the hint of applying the figure of the ram to their compasses, however formed and gave it the name of the ram, or golden fleece, which the Greek fables, their most ancient history, ring of, and hence their ships derived their oracular quality. Phrixus's ship, the golden ram, being said to speak on occasion, as well as the ship Argos. The stupendous properties of this stone, without difficulty, would persuade even those above the vulgar that there was a divine principle in it, quite metaphysical, consequently oracular. And in the dawnings of idolatry, the evil agent who was vigilant to pervert everything to his own purpose would not fail to make great use of the secrets of the magnet. The entire notion of oracles among the heathen is caused by the devil's mimicry of God's transactions among the patriarchs and the Jews. But I believe the Egyptians took their notion of carrying a boat in all their religious processions from this magnetic boat, of which both Herodotus and Plutarch inform us for they intended it to signify the movement and descent of the divine ideas from the supreme mind, especially the very fountain and principle of those ideas, and it must be owned to be admirably well chose. Hence the top and the bottom of the verge, or limbus, of the celebrated Isaac tablet is adorned with a boat, in one a ram, in the other a bull, meaning the origin of the chain of ideas flowing from the divine mind. Tis highly probable that with the ram is the copy of Jupiter Ammon's boat mentioned by Curtius, and I suppose this is Herwart's opinion, but I have not yet seen his book. Of course, I shall discourse larger in my explication of the Bremen table. However, Herodotus tells us in his second book that the temple of Jupiter Ammon took its rise from Phoenicia. I only mention this for the sake of those that are overacting the credit of antiquities in Egypt. We learn in Plutarch's discourse De Acide and Osir that the ship Argos of the Greeks was in reality the ship that our Hercules sailed round the world in. Further, this oracular ship has its name Argos, says my friend Mr. Baxter, Gloss Ant Rome, from the Hebrew and Syrian word Aragon, an ark, which confirms what I said above concerning the carrying about the ship of Ammon on the shoulder of the priests. 
Strabo, in second of his geography, mentions the temple of Leucothea, built by Phrixus at Colchis, that there was an oracle there, and that the sheep was never slain at the place. This shows its relation to that of Jupiter Ammon. Leucothea is the name of consecration of Hercules, his mother, Hercules himself being called Palamian, both made sea deities, from the extraordinary fame of Hercules, the first and great sea captain. Pausanias in Atticus says he was buried in the Corinthian Isthmus, where the Isthmian games were kept to his memory, but Mela writes that his remains were at Gates. It's probable there was only an honorary monument of him at the Isthmus as founder, as the honorary monument of Jolius mentioned to be among the Thebans by the Stadium, page 42. Mr. Baxter in Gloss and Rom v. Ascania makes Phrixus to be a Phrixus and the same person as Jupiter Ammon, or the founder of the temple of Jupiter Ammon, rather of that prior to Jupiter Ammon. We are not to regard the little artifices of the Greeks who draw all celebrated events and persons of antiquity into their own country. A Phrixus, no doubt, is the Afri before mentioned son of Midian, son of Abraham, whom Clodemus makes an associate of Hercules in his Libyan wars. Josephus makes him the conqueror of Libya, and that he gave his name to Africa. Tis not unlikely but that he is the hero that traveled over these barren sands by the help of the compass, as his countrymen the Arabians have from times immemorial practiced in traveling over their own deserts, and might probably erect a patriarchal temple there, and in times of his posterity it degenerated into the idolatrous temple of Jupiter Ammon, and there the compass box of the hero remained, and was converted into part of the heathen sacreds. Tis no very strange matter if they at another time call this same hero Bacchus, therein confounding him with the like travels of the Israelites through the Arabian deserts. We are not to expect these histories of old times involved in fable, absolutely consistent. But if this account be agreeable to truth or near it, then we may imagine the same Afri, by the Greeks called Phrixus, according to Mr. Baxter, passed the Hellespont, made the expedition into Colchis, and built a like temple there. And a compass box called the Golden Ram was made a like part of the object of their adoration. This is exceedingly confirmed by the report of Herodotus and Dodorus S., who say the Colchi practiced the rite of circumcision, a matter which the learned cannot account for, but appears plain from hence, these being the descendants of Abraham. They say at the same time that the Ethiopians practiced the like, and that tis no recent custom among them, but from the beginning. I apprehend by Ethiopians are meant Arabians, who are people descended from Abraham. Herodotus says likewise the Egyptians circumcised, which must be accounted for in this same manner, some Arabian or Ethiopian nation bringing the custom among them. As a further confirmation of Phrixus being a Phrixus, Bockert shows the Colchic and Hebrew tongue is much akin. And thus we may account for what Mr. Toland, page 133, says, that the idiom of the Irish language, which we suppose the remnant of most ancient Oriental, has a mixture of Arabic in it. I saw a book in Dr. Mead's library, Museo de las Medallas Desconocidas Españolas, page 35, numbers 82-83, are two ancient unknown medals, such as they often find in Spain. The first a head, not of the best workmanship, on the obverse, young but heroical enough, a necklace on. Behind it, a-O-P-A, in the old Phoenician character, like the Samaritan. Reverse a horseman, and under the exergue, another word in like Punic character. The other, number 83, has the same head in the obverse, but without the necklace, and A-O-P-A before, in plain Greek, behind a dolphin. The reverse as the last. There is another such coin in the same book, no difference, but the name and dolphin transposed. I verily believe this is our Aphra, or Afer, in our English translation, called Ephra, Genesis chapter 25, verse 4, 
struck by some city in Spain who acknowledged him their founder. It is remarkable enough what Mr. Norden writes in his history of Cornwall. The Cornish men universally suppose that the Jews are the people who first worked in their rocks for tin, and in old neglected tin works they find some of their tools. The workmen call them Atol Sarazin, the Jews cast off works, in their Hebrew speech, says Norden. Now I apprehend he means our Arabians, and it is a circumstance confirming the former nations. And to it we may refer the origin of the odd reports of our Stonehenge coming from Africa and the like. By the Greeks, Hercules, Melcartus, or Meliserta, and Phrixus, or Apricus, are made half-brothers. By Josephus, Hercules is son-in-law to Africus. The Phoenicians paid tithe, so the Arabians, in Pliny, the like, being patriarchal customs. Africus, or Phrixus, we may very well suppose to be the father of the Phrygians, and his expedition through the Propontis to the Euxine Sea, the Greeks color over with their Hella and Hellespont. But we cannot entertain too high a respect for him, because I see it no less reasonable to refer the origin of the Britons to him. I mean that eastern colony that came hither with Hercules upon the old possessors or Aborigines Albionites, which gave the more famous name of Britain to the island. The Brigantes is the same name, says Mr. Baxter, the common and more ancient name of this people, who being driven northward by inundations of foreigners from the continent in after times, the name became more appropriate to the inhabitants of Yorkshire and the neighboring counties. In Tacitus, the Brigantes are called Maxima Britannorum Natio. At the same time, they force the ancientest possessors, the Albionites, or Albanians, still more northward. Likewise, many of these Brigantes passed into Ireland, where they became a famous nation. The Brigas, Firgas, Frixi, Brysons, Brigantes, Britons are entirely synonymous words in different dialects. And this assignment of the origin of our ancestors very well accounts for that notion of their Phrygian or Trojan descent so riveted in the mind of the old Britons. A notion which prevailed among some of the Gallic nations on the continent, and they had retained the memory of it, in the time of Amanius Marcellinus, who mentions it. Likewise, in Caesar's time, some Gallic nations claimed kindred with the Romans, probably upon this very account. This is, in short, some presumptive evidence we have of Hercules and Africus planting Britain, introducing the Druids with the patriarchal religion, and concerning the knowledge they had of the use of the compass. This whole matter will be further considered when I come to treat of it expressly. At present, we will continue the history of the compass as it became more fully known to the world. Martinius, in his Atlas and Gilbertus de Magente, Lib. 1-2, show us the Chinese have used the magnetic needles from time immemorial, that they have a trick of telling fortunes with it, as the heathen aforementioned made it oracular. The Arabians likewise have used it for traveling over the great and wild deserts of weeks together, where there is no track to guide them, nor have they any notion of time when they begin this practice. Herwartius published Admiranda Ethnica Theologica, wherein he endeavors to prove that the old Egyptians had the use of the magnetic needle and that the Bemben table contains the doctrine of it enveloped in hieroglyphics. The learned Fuller in his Miscellanies Lieb 419 asserts that the Phoenicians knew the use of it, which they endeavored to conceal by all possible means as they did their trading in general, that it was lost with them, as many other arts, their Ars Plumaria, the dying of purple, the invention of our Hercules of Tyre, the Hebrew poetry, and other curious knowledge which is perished. Tis not unlikely that the lodestone being applied to religious use was one cause of its being forgot, together with the secrecy of the Phoenician voyages. Suetonius in Nero speaks of a prophetic needle, which the emperor used to pay his devotions to. The learned Berman shows that most or all of the old MSS and printed books read it Acuncula, Acucula, or Acungula, which, in my opinion, the critics have costlessly corrected 
into acuncula because they had no notion of the magnetic needle being understood by it. Monsieur Fosset, a famous French antiquary, in his Antiquities of France, quotes some verses from a poet in that country who wrote A.D. 1180, wherein is as plain a description of the mariner's box as words can make. The poet mentions it by accident, not as a thing new and strange. Osorius, in his discourse of the acts of King Emmanuel, refers to the use of compass among the Europeans, to Gama and the Portuguese, who found it among some barbarous pirates about the Cape of Good Hope, who probably were some remains of the old Phoenicians or Arabians, or at least have preserved from them this practice. About A.D. 1260, Paulus Venetus is said to have brought it from China by the great author on the magnet, our countryman, Gilbert. Genebron, in his Cron, says the use of the lodestone revived among us about A.D. 1303 by F.L. Melvius was a Neapolitan, and others attribute it about that time to John Goya, a Neapolitan. Joseph de Costa says some Mahometan seamen whom Vasquez de Gama met with near Mozambique, who had sailed those seas by the use thereof, taught it him. I observe our ancient Britons, the Welsh, call a steersman or pilot Islewild, whence no doubt comes our English word lodestone and lodestar, the North Pole. The wool is the helm of a ship in British. Load manage in Skinner's Entomology, an old English word, signifying the price paid to the pilot. Our lords of the sink ports keep a court at Dover by that name. These things seem to indicate some memorial of the magnet left among the Welsh from the oldest times and of its application to sailing. Thus we have given a kind of history of this prodigy in nature, the magnetic needle to confirm our suspicion that the British Druids knew the use of it and used it in these works of theirs which we have been treating of. We learn in the Philosophical Transactions, Lowthorpe, Volume 2, page 601, that there are considerable veins of the magnet in our own country, in Devonshire, where the Phoenicians and Druids must needs be very conversant. We return now to our first subject, Stonehenge, and apply what has been said to the observation we there made. It is not to be thought that the Druids, men who employed themselves in those noble studies, which Caesar gives us an account of, and who were at the pains of bringing these vast stones together from such a considerable distance of sixteen miles. I say it is not to be thought, but that they would be nice and exact in placing them and this not only particularly in respect of each other upon the projected ground plot but also in general in respect of the quarters of the heavens and this i found to be a just surmise when i examined their works for several years together with sufficient accuracy with a theodolite as i took notice before the works of one place regarded the cardinal points but with a certain uniform variation therefrom whence I grounded my conjecture that they were set by a compass which at that time varied according to the quantity observed, of which property of variation we may well suppose the Druids were ignorant. This I now propose for the rule of investigation of the time when Stonehenge was erected, hoping the reader will judge as favorably of the attempt as things of this great antiquity require. The variation at Stonehenge is about six or seven degrees from the north eastward. I have, in order to form our hypothesis, set down a scheme of the state of the variation in England from the best observations I could meet with. Dr. Halley takes notice that the variation at Paris is always two degrees and a half more easterly than with us. Arontius Phineas, in 1550, observed it to be there about nine degrees easterly, therefore to reduce it. I have stated it at 11 degrees 30, and from thence continued it to the present time as in the ensuing table. Anno Domini, 1550, observation by Phineas, variation 11 degrees 30 minutes east. Anno Domini, 1580, observation by Mr. Burroughs, variation 11 degrees 15 minutes east. Anno Domini, 1600, 
variation 8 degrees 0 minutes east. Anno Domini 1622, observation by Mr. Gunter, variation 6 degrees 0 minutes east. Anno Domini 1634, observation by Mr. Gellibrand, variation 4 degrees 5 minutes east. Anno Domini 1642, variation 3 degrees 5 minutes east. Anno Domini 1657, observation by Mr. Bond, no variation. Anno Domini 1665, observation by Mr. Bond, variation 1 degree 22 minutes west. Anno Domini 1666, observation by Captain Sturmey, Variation, 1 degree, 27 minutes west. Anno Domini, 1667. Observation by Captain Sturmey. Variation, 1 degree, 33 minutes west. Anno Domini, 1672. Observation by Dr. Halley. Variation, 2 degrees, 30 minutes west. Anno Domini, 1683. Variation, 4 degrees, 30 minutes west. Anno Domini, 1685, variation, 5 degrees, 5 minutes west. Anno Domini, 1692, variation, 6 degrees, 0 minutes west. Anno Domini, 1723, variation, 11 degrees, 0 minutes west. Anno Domini 1733, variation 12 degrees, 0 minutes west. Anno Domini 1740, variation 15 degrees, 45 minutes west. By this table it appears that in the space of 180 years, the variation of the magnetic needle in England has shifted from 11 degrees and a half eastward to 11 degrees and a half westward. In 90 years, the medium of those extremes, which was 1657, there was no variation at all, the needle pointing due north and south. But alas, our observations extend no farther. We know not the bound of the variation on either hand, nor the quantity of its motion, when thereabouts. Mr. George Graham thinks it is now near the western bound. It is very slow in all probability when upon the return, and as it were, stationary, like the sun's motion at the tropics when it is returning. So that the nice determination of its circle and of its motion is reserved for remote posterity. Dr. Halley conjectures that the whole period of variation is performed in about 700 years. Upon this supposition in gross, we may thus found our conjecture of the time of building of Stonehenge. By what we can find, the variation is about nine minutes in a year, or a degree and a half in ten years at this part of its circle. Now I observed at Stonehenge that the eastern wing of the avenue, the cursus and other parts belonging to the temple, abated somewhat in their variation eastward, being somewhat less than that of the temple itself. It is highly reasonable to believe that the great work of Stonehenge could not take less than half a score years in building, and that those other works were made in succeeding years, not long after it was finished. From hence I gather which way the magnetic variation was moving at the time of founding Stonehenge, viz from east toward no variation, and so to the west. This must be the foundation of our calculus. Therefore, at the time of the founding of Stonehenge, the variation was about the same quantity in place as about A.D. 1620 in our preceding table. Supposing with Dr. Halley the revolution of this variation be about 700 years, three entire revolutions thereof bring us to about the year of the city of Rome, 280 which is about 460 years before our Savior's time, 420 years before Caesar invaded Britain, and about 100 years before our Savior's birth. Davitiacus made the Wandsdyke north of Stonehenge and drove the possessors of this fine country of the Wiltshire Downs northwards, so that the Druids enjoyed their magnificent work of Stonehenge, but about 360 years. And the very great number of barrows about it requires that we should not much shorten the time. Sir Isaac Newton, in his chronology, reckons 19 years for a medium of a king's reign. So in that space, there were about 19 kings in this country. 
and there seems to be about that number of royal barrows in my way of conjecturing about the place i observe this time we have assigned for the building of stonehenge is not long after cambyses invasion of egypt when he committed such horrid outrages there and made such dismal havoc with the priests and inhabitants in general that they fled the country to all parts of the world some went as far as the east indies and there taught many of the ancient egyptian customs as is taken notice of by the learned it is not to be doubted that some of them fled as far westward into the island of britain and introduced some of their learning arts and religion among the druids and perhaps had a hand in this very work of stonehenge the only one that i know of where the stones are chiselled all other works of theirs are of rude stones untouched of tool exactly after the patriarchal and jewish mode therefore older this was at a time when the phoenician trade was at height the readier a conveyance to britain it was before the second temple at jerusalem was built before the grecians had any history directions to the binder all the half sheet plates are to be bound up with the book as single leaves according to their pages and without guards viz plate number one two four six seven eight nine ten twelve fourteen fifteen sixteen twenty three twenty four twenty five twenty six twenty seven twenty eight twenty nine thirty thirty one thirty two thirty three thirty four thirty five those plates numbers eleven seventeen nineteen twenty one are to be once folded in the middle and bound up with guards those plates number three five thirteen eighteen twenty twenty two are to be folded in three parts and bound up with guards end of chapter twelve end of stonehenge a temple restored to the british druids by william stukeley